Well, good afternoon and welcome to this uh, session of the Justice Committee. Uh, Grateful for the colleagues who are with us either here or in the room. Um, can I welcome the Lord Chancellor? Thank you very much for joining us, Lord Chancellor. Very grateful to you. Uh, and I know remotely, uh, as well as the Right Honourable Robert Buckland, QCMP, we also have uh, the two senior officials dealing with the matters we're going to talk about. Uh, Ms. Ackland and Ms. Farrah. Perhaps you'd just like to say hello to everybody. Good to see you both. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Ms. Ackland Ms. Farrah, hi. Hello. Good afternoon. Hi. And of course, Ms. Ackland Hood is um, Chief Executive of the Prison Service and Ms. Farrah uh, of the HMCTS and Ms. Farrah of uh, the Prison Service. It's, it's the lockdown hasn't got to me that much, I promise you. <laughs> but anyway, between the three of you, I'm sure we'll be able to deal with the issues. We need to start, as you're all familiar with, with the declarations of interest, I'm afraid. Um, uh, I'm a non practicing barrister and consultant to a law firm. Uh, I was uh, a magistrate member of the Sentencing Council and non executive director of HMPPS prior to my election. Very relevant interest. I'm a practicing solicitor and partner in a high street law firm. Great. Uh, anybody who's on there remotely wants to come in? Ms. Igor? Yes, I'm a non practicing solicitor chair. Mr. Bergen? Uh, yeah, I was a solicitor before being elected to Parliament. Uh, Mr. Slaughter? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a non practicing barrister chair. Okay, thank you. Very much. I think that's covered everybody as far as that's concerned. Okay, Lord Charles. Well, thank you very much, as I say. Um, I'd like to kick off, obviously, with, uh, with we're concerned with the whole situation of the, of the COVID pandemic and, and its impact on the various aspects of the department's responsibilities. Yes. Um, 22nd of May, the Lord Chief Justice said that the courts were operating at around 50% uh, of normal capacity. Just wonder, where have we moved on to since then? What, and of course, that varied within jurisdictions, he told us as well. Can you and perhaps Ms Ackland would help us as to the up-to-date figures? Yes, of course. Um, a lot has happened since the 22nd of May, Sir Bob. Uh, I'm glad to say that as the weeks go by, more and more court sites are being reopened. So uh, as I speak to you now, we have uh, 246 buildings open to the public. Uh, we have 58 courts that are staffed by uh, judges and other members of the team to deal with administrative hearings and then 37 sites where operations are still suspended. So since the beginning of this month, we've opened an extra 86 sites. How many of those are able to operate at anything like normal capacity? Well, I think what we're seeing is uh, a rapidly improving position. So Susan can come in with the detail, but my recollection is that pre-COVID, about 8,000 or so hearings were being held every day across the jurisdictions. And now we're up to about 7,000 hearings being held. That is, of course, a mixture of uh, virtual uh, hearings and, indeed, uh, actual hearings. Uh, and, of course, the story of this crisis has been the ramping up in scale of the use of technology, yeah. which has singled out this jurisdiction in the world as a jurisdiction which meant that justice could continue to operate, uh, as opposed to many other jurisdictions where the courts simply closed because of the crisis. But I don't know whether you don't want to hear from Susan Ackland. Yes, please. Yeah, Ms Ackland, would you like to come in? Chance is entirely correct. So, in terms of total numbers of hearings, we're increasing rapidly what we're able to do, but the position varies across the different jurisdictions because some of our work is much more affected than others by the requirements for social distancing. And uh, so, within that, we published uh, management information on the 11th of June, uh, which sets out um, what we had done through March and May, which gives a bit of a picture of that. And you can see that, for example, in some of the tribunal's jurisdictions where we've been successfully able to move not just many of our preliminary hearings, but quite a lot of our substantive hearings onto audio and video, we're operating at close to full capacity. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, the activity that is probably hardest for us with full social distancing in place is jury trial yeah. and as the committee will know we have restarted jury trials but the numbers are still small and that's still an area of concern for me and for the Lord Chancellor we're working really hard to try to make sure that we can do everything we can to hear as many trials as we can but it remains constrained by social distancing. Yeah. 
will, will any change from one to two metres make any significant difference to that? Change, but we will need to do more in a nutshell. But Susan can come in with yeah, some okay, of the figures. Yes, I mean, these are relatively rough estimates. We've done a lot of work on what two metres means for the court estate and have more recently been doing the work on one metre. And we estimate that it'll take us from being able to use uh, um, around a, a third of our capacity in a normal way to more like two thirds, although it's very dependent on the detail. And we are working, as everyone else is now, to look at the precise detail of the mitigating measures we would need to put in place uh, because the announcement that's been made by the Prime Minister isn't a straight shift from two no, metres to exactly. one and understanding the mitigations. The mitigations may be quite difficult to do, mightn't it? Yes, yeah, so it, it, we, we, again we're looking at that in, in some detail now but um, we, we, we need to think really carefully about what some of the things that have been suggested, such as the wearing of masks, mean in a context where the activity that is being engaged in is people speaking to each other. Um, yeah. That raises a specific issue, Lord Charles, so you can deal with, because the uh, issue was, many of us say, perhaps reasonably taken, with the wearing of face coverings by witnesses giving evidence in jury trials for entirely separate uh, uh, reasons. Uh, and I think some of the judges at first instance made certain rulings about that. How would we factor that in, for example? The argument is it gets in the way of demeanour and so on and assessment. Well, I think we will adapt, uh, Sir Bob. I think uh, where participants perhaps don't need to uh, speak, jurors, perhaps other members of the team, staff members, then the wearing of coverings could work. Yeah. Uh, clearly we'll need to use perspex where appropriate as yeah. well. Uh, I can see that being particularly relevant where perhaps legal representatives are addressing a court or yes. a witness is giving evidence. But I think that, uh, you know, I can think of, for example, Crown Courts where you yep. have docks already enclosed, so we've yes, already dealt that. with that, that issue anyway for uh, unrelated yep. reasons. I'm sure that we can make the adaptations. And let's not forget that in 19, I'm taking Crown Courts as yes. an example now where the issue has been the most yes. sensitive and acute. In the 19 Crown Courts that are operating, the spreading of the trial process across two or even three rooms has been tried and tested yep. now and found to work. Uh, and that's due to the hard work of staff, of practitioners and of yes. judges in actually making sure that uh, everything is tested and tried in, in accordance with not just Public Health England but Public Health Wales as well yep. in the Welsh courts. And I think a big thanks is due to everybody for their hard yep. work to getting us this far. I, th I think that, that, that's clearly true, a vast amount of work has, has been put in. I'm going to come back to the big issue in a moment, but I think I'm also right, Ms Ackland, I'm told that on the, our earlier figures, the magistrates' courts, we were told, were operating at about 25% of usual volumes. Um, do I get the sense that has changed somewhat? Um, and, of course, within magistrates' court, you've got an awful lot of things which have been done by single justice procedure. Uh, and so on. So what, what, what's the real impact in terms of actually trials and other matters that's, that's there? Yes, so it's true that earlier in the crisis we, uh, so particularly very early on, we focused right down on the most urgent matters in the magistrates court and were making sure that we could hear, for example, the urgent overnight cases uh, as quickly as we needed to. Uh, we've now started listing all types of matters into the magistrates' courts, um, and that means we're seeing volumes of trial and other matters going up. We're listing youth court, we're listing gap and end gaps now as well, um, and uh, we are seeking to do as much work as we can. It's still true that our again, it's still true that our capacity is constrained. So we have to we have to be very serious. We've done risk assessments in every court to look at. The amount of capacity that we can safely use while making sure that we aren't making uh, people come into excessively close contact. And that, that affects both the number of courtrooms we can use safely and the intensity with which we can list. So again, many of you will be intimately familiar with the workings of the magistrate's court, but the kind of normal mode of operation of the magistrate's court is to list extremely heavily yes. uh, on the assumption that cases Will, will crack and fall out and that, that comes with a lot of people sitting together yeah. in a waiting room which obviously is not appropriate at the moment 
So we're still, we are still operating well under normal capacity in the magistrates court. What we've done is assessed what we think is the safe operation capacity yeah. of each court, seeking to get to be listing as close to that as possible. And we're also looking at other measures which will enable us to use the space more intensively without filling it with people, uh, which is why you will have seen um, discussions of, for example, looking at extended hours. Thank you very much. Well, Lord Charles, the elephant in the room is jury trials, isn't it? Yes. There's any number of reports suggesting the government is going to restrict the right to trial by jury, is it? Well, we've got to look at all the options, and I think of all the Lords Chancellor in, frankly, recent history, I'm the one with the biggest experience of jury trials. You know, I used to do dozens a year, probably, yeah. well, it might even be four figures in terms yeah. of contested jury trials in my professional career, so I think sure. I... I'm equipped to talk with knowledge yeah. and experience about jury trials. Juries are the worst system apart from all the others. Uh, and I've believed that uh, throughout my time in practice and indeed my time as a parliamentarian as a, and as a minister. And therefore I have to take a lot of persuading before there's even a temporary departure from the use of juries in our system. Um, however, we are facing an unprecedented challenge uh, the number of cases to be dealt with has been valiantly managed by the current uh, constraints, but that does leave quite a number of cases which will uh, sit there for longer and longer, and I have to think about defendants, I have to think about witnesses, and I have to think about complainants and victims in all of this. So these aren't just cold statistics, these are real lives here that we're dealing with. And I've got to get the balance right between making sure that we have a fair system of justice that everybody recognises as free and fair, and one also that has managed its way through this particular crisis. That means there are a number of options that we have been looking at for some time. First and foremost, maximising the space that we have, and we've already talked about what might be done with the one metre rule coming in. Secondly, looking at increasing that capacity, and that's why from a very early stage I was a strong advocate of what were known as Nightingale Courts, we're calling them Blackstone Courts to give them a bit of a legal context, <laughs> and the work that's been done by HMCTS, by the judges, by practitioners once again to identify alternative accommodation is already yielding fruit. Uh, and I've been able to officially sign off a number of uh, alternative venues uh, this week, which we want to get up and running uh, over the next few months. But I'm going to need to scale that operation up dramatically uh, and to unprecedented heights yeah. uh, if I'm going to uh, not just deal with the current backlog, but also yeah, manage it in a position that I think is sustainable for the long term. So I need also to look at court hours, and making sure that we maximise the court sitting day to stagger appearances by both practitioners and court users uh, and therefore sit uh, as long as we can on more, perhaps even more days of the week than we do at the moment to make sure that we manage the battle. <coughs> and then, and only then, uh, does the uh, alternative of a change to part of the system uh, really come into play. Um, for some months now, I've spoken about the experience that we had in the war, where yes. we reduced juries to, uh, in the vast majority of cases, tribal and on indictment, to a minimum of seven. Uh, I'm still very attracted by that proposition. I think that's got a lot of merit because it preserves the principle whilst managing the number. And then, secondly, the proposal that you heard uh, enunciated by the Lord Chief Justice. Uh, and which has uh, been discussed in recent days, that is relating to a judge and two magistrates where cases uh, fit, fit within the either way category. In other words, cases that could be tried in the magistrate's court, but which for either a defendant's choice or the magistrate's decision uh, end up in the Crown Court. And it's that group of cases that I think we need to focus on. Uh, I think there, there may well be a way forward here in managing those cases with a judge and two magistrates. But within that, there are a myriad of different options as well as to how far that might extend, whether it should be limited to uh, certain offences and not others. Uh, and of course, we've always got to think rightly about the interests of justice, uh, right to a fair trial, but also the fact that we need to deliver justice expeditiously 
in accordance with all the principles that have been set out in the criminal procedure rules and elsewhere. Um, so where we are is at the moment actively working and getting those practical solutions up and running as you would expect us to, but secondly canvassing and developing policy options that could make a difference. I wonder if Susan might come in to talk through what we think in percentage terms the measures that I've discussed give us in terms of extra capacity. That might be something okay. the committee I, I would like do, to but Before hear. I do that, frankly, that's a shift in position, Lord Chancellor, isn't it, from the government? Uh, you've been a robust um, defender of the, uh, the principle of uh, jury trials should not be uh, uh, touched. Your junior minister, Mr Philp, was very firm when he gave evidence before our committee only two or three weeks ago that there was no question of any change of jury trials. So what's happened? Well, first of all, I think the context initially was discussion about having a judge only to do trials, which I've utterly rejected and continue to robustly uh, reject. Uh, what we are doing is looking as a last resort at a response to capacity. Yeah. And uh, I think I'm absolutely duty-bound to consider where the evidence and the information uh, justifies it, to look at measures that deliver the capacity that we need. Because two-thirds capacity isn't going to cut it. I'm not going to be able to deal with a caseload and a backlog with only two-thirds. I'm going to need at least 100% capacity, if not more, in order to not just manage the caseload, but to get ahead of it as well, in a way that I think the public would expect us to. But I think Susan might be able to explain yeah, yeah, some yeah, of the yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Is that yeah, reasoning. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so we've done a little bit of work, and I should say this is, uh, at the moment, it's relatively early analysis, initially based on a really thorough review in the southeast of England, although we have now checked that it is coming out proportionately when we look at the whole country. But this basically says to us that, so there are, there are two things that concern me. The first is the size of the outstanding caseload, which is growing, and you can see that in the management information. But from that, the problem looks more acute in the magistrates' court than in the Crown Court, because the numbers have grown more rapidly there. And that's partly a tribute to all of the work that Crown Court judges have done to try and use preliminary hearings where they haven't been able to hold trials in order to try and manage work down. Uh, and But at the headline level, the backlogs we're seeing, or the outstanding caseloads, are not higher than levels we've seen in the past. So if you go back through the record, you can see significantly higher levels than we've got at the moment uh, in relatively recent times. So the second thing that concerns me is the rate at which we're able to run in order to recover those outstanding cases. And that is where this situation feels very different from uh, recent times. So in the past, where we built up large numbers of outstanding cases, we've been able to use the whole of the capacity of the system and to run at a very rapid rate in order to recover. And the challenge that we see at the moment is, a, I was describing this a little bit earlier on, that um, certainly at two metre social distancing and even at one metre, if we use the full capacity of the court system that we have, we are still well below the level where we can get our disposals to equal the receipt, level of receipts we expect to see. So the backlog will continue to grow for the foreseeable future unless we do something different. So we've then modelled what the effect of some of the other measures that the Lord Chancellor has talked about might be. So if you take um, additional courts, in order to fill the whole of the gap with additional courts, we would have to find somewhere in the region of 200 or more additional venues. And to find such additional venues that are suitable for a jury trial, and particularly suitable for custodial jury trials, where we need cell provision and security, uh, feels extremely challenging. So we, we are searching for and finding alternative venues and we are pursuing those extremely actively. As the Lord Trust said, he signed off the first set of those this week, so you should see yeah. more on that soon. But there's just a question about whether we can do that at the scale that is required in order to meet the challenge that we've got. The second thing we've modelled is extending hours. Uh, but even if we were to extend hours to the extent that we had an extra 50% of capacity on what we've got at the moment. Even that does not take us to the level where we fill the whole of the gap to get this both to equal the level of receipts. And that is why uh, we've been uh, giving the advice that we need to be ready to look at other measures in addition in order to make sure that we can uh, realistically recover. 
Um, and uh, those that the Lord Chancellor has described are some of the things which we think would get us to the position, in addition to the other measures I've described. So you still need extended hours and you still need additional provision, but you also need something else on top to get you to the point where we can dispose of more cases than are coming in and start to reduce the level of outstanding work. And that's clearly what we must do. Um, uh, and we've got somehow we've got to find measures that mean that we aren't building up outstanding cases because, as the Lord Chancellor has said, you know this is not a statistical exercise. Even though I may sometimes make it sound like one, it's people's lives, um, and uh, in many cases, people in extremely difficult circumstances who are waiting for decisions from us. Okay, um, Lord Chancellor, you're prepared to go to the Treasury, I imagine, and say, "Well, I need more money to um, pay for more recorders." To sit every physically available yeah. court, like can we social distancing to the maximum capacity? Yeah, well, look, thank you, Bob. It gives me an opportunity to make it very clear about what's happened with uh, court, Crown yes. Court listing yes. days. Right. I'd already agreed an increase in yes. listing days for the year ahead, and we were coming close to an agreement that would have seen many thousands more yes. days being listed in the Crown yes. Court for the year yes. ahead. We're now in a position where, frankly, those sort of exercises are academic. Yeah. This is all about making sure we have the capacity and the ability to actually hear cases. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, I think questions of limit really do not arise. It's yeah, about right. how much we can do within the available space. Yeah, absolutely. So I've signed off on the 10 additional uh, Nightingale courts. Yeah. As Susan says, I'd have to do that 20 times over. I want to scale that up. Yeah. But I also need to be realistic about the options ahead and also remembering the fact that I want to, and we want to deal with this this caseload in the next few months yeah. rather than Understood. years. And that's an important point as well. And can I say this? Lots being said about years and years of caseload. Not true. Mm. Uh, any suggestion of two, three, or I saw today five years is wrong. Uh, we are confident that we can manage the magistrate's caseload uh, backlog this year. Uh, the Crown Court is somewhat more complex, yeah. but we think that we can, with all the measures that we've talked about, or a combination of them, yeah. uh, deal with this problem uh, uh, by Easter of 2021. Okay. That's the scale of the ambition, uh, and uh, that's what I think uh, the public would expect of us. Okay. That, that's very helpful. Thank you. Mr. Slaughter, do you want to come in? Yeah, Chair, Chair thank you, and good afternoon. Um, can we just be clear when we're talking about jury trials on the, the figures first of all i think exactly have just said that there's been a higher backlog sometime in the recent past is that right yeah. when was that and what and what was that backlog yeah, what yeah. was the backlog what yeah. was the backlog before covid set in and how much is it increasing by month on month at the moment yes um I have immediately available to me a figure back in 2014 of a Crown Court outstanding backlog figure of 55,116 uh, and the makeup of that, I mean there were, uh, of which there were 30,000 cases awaiting trial and the rest were a combination of committals for sentence and other hearings. Uh, with regard to the pre-Covid baseline. Um, I'm just trying to get the figure uh, to hand. I think the Susan, I don't know whether you've got the pre-COVID baseline. I think, forgive me, I have it. It's, it was in the Crown Court. Uh, the pre-COVID case line in the Crown Court was 39,214 outstanding cases. And in, in the Magistrates Court, the pre-COVID baseline was 406,610. But I don't know whether Susan's got any more figures as to, as to that or, and where we are now. So on the, on the pre-COVID baselines, you'll be delighted to hear, Lord Chancellor, that your figures and mine entirely agree. And those are also part of the published management information that we put out. So if you want to find those, you can find those on .gov.uk. Um, in terms of the latest published figures, we've got the figures of 24th of May. Um, uh, outstanding in the Crown Court had risen to 40,526. Um, outstanding in the magistrates had risen much more significantly to 483,678. Okay, thank you for that. Could I stick with the Crown Court? Because I, I want to um, 
continue with this point on jury trials, which I think, uh, certainly judging by our inboxes, is, is an issue that has seized the um, public attention, or at least professional attention at the moment. Um, <coughs> looking at those figures, it's clear there is a significant problem. It's clear it's not as serious as it has been in the recent past. Yes. And it's also clear that the increase post-COVID, while it is an increase, has not been significant compared with the existing backlog. Yes. So while commending the efforts that you're making to identify um, other means uh, of, of expanding the system, yes. and, um, and the figure of 200 is a significant figure, but perhaps not an impossible figure in terms of, in terms of, of, of venues, it seems therefore like a, not perhaps an overreaction, but, but a, a reaction on a different scale to even be contemplating restriction of jury trials at the moment, whether that's by reducing juries or by what we've heard about either way offences. Um, could you say a, a little more about that? Yes. In other words, where, where we are in terms of the, the increase now, that yes. has to be brought under control and be brought down. But it, it begins to look like, with a number of things that COVID do, that this is an opportunity that COVID is given, rather than a crisis which COVID dictates. And to run to restricting jury trials seems like a complete overreaction. Well, uh, Mr Stoddard, I, I, I first of all understand entirely why you asked that question. And can I say that I share your instinct about jury trials. Um, as I said at the outset, I'm extremely reluctant to see a position where there's a restriction, even if it's a temporary one. Uh, and by the way, if it is to be a temporary one, then it's my condition that it would have to be sunsetted in an absolute way so that there was no doubt or, 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 or haziness about the fact that they were time-limited and not permanent. But I think to answer your question directly, the headline numbers you are right, reflect an increase, but not one that looks alarming. However, within those numbers, I think there's, um, should we say, a fairly large cohort of cases that will require a trial. In other words, there's been good case management by resident judges and judges up and down the country to deal with uh, PTPH and other hearings, those guilty pleas, to, to deal with them, to get them uh, in a position where they are waiting sentence or being weighed off at sentence. And therefore, boiling it down, you know, to use a cooking metaphor, we are left with the residue of cases, the, the majority of which will require a trial. But Susan, again, might have some more information and detail about that. Yes, that's, yes, that's right. So it's both about the nature of the cases that are left in there, not just the overall size of the backlog, but it's also, as I said earlier, about the pace at which we can realistically work to recover. So one of the things we've been modelling is if we continue to do jury trials as we have been doing them, where we, we, we take three rooms per jury trial, uh, we can't list as intensively as normal. Um, and there are many rooms in the estate that we simply can't use at all because we can't fit the jury into them in a socially distanced way. What is the, how, how quickly could we recover that backlog? And the initial, as I said, the initial position is to, unless we do something different, and we can't recover that position, we will continue to build further backlog. And none of us wants to be in a position where we're allowing an outstanding caseload to grow. We need to get to the point where we're reducing it. And, just very briefly, I, I, I do think that it, it's not realistic to, um, to think that we can find readily 200 rooms outside the existing court estate which will support custodial jury trial. We're looking for space that we can use for all types of work across the court system and it may be that we can find uh, space that we can use, for example, for civil family or tribunals work and then we can shift things around the estate. But the, the needs of a particularly a custodial jury trial do make it a bit more difficult than it might otherwise be because we have to make sure that we are keeping people securely. Um, and you know, we will do absolutely everything we can through that route. No one says you're not doing your best to look at all, at all options, but while you've got the escape route, as it were, of restricting jury trials, 
perhaps that doesn't concentrate the mind entirely. If I may, just two more questions on this subject. The first, on the process. Now, it would be nice if Lord Chancellor could tell us this afternoon which way he's moving, i.e., on a percentage basis, how likely the institute jury trials are going to be restricted and by what means, and at the very least, when that decision mm. is going to be made, i.e., when, when can we expect to hear something definitive on this? Because we've heard what the Lord Chief Justice said last week. It's clear from what's been said already today that it's something you're seriously thinking about. What is the mechanism you would use? Is it restricting either way trials to uh, 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 judges to magistrates? Uh, or is it something else? And when are you likely to be thinking of introducing that if you are? All right. Um, well, well, thank you, Mr Slaughter. I think the options are these with regard to jury trials. There are two real options. One, the uh, either way option, the judge and two magistrates, and then two, the smaller jury option. Um, and as I've said, I've long you know, canvassed and aired the view about a smaller jury. I, I think from my understanding of the situation, certainly at two metres, smaller juries would deliver us perhaps an extra 5 to 10% capacity. I think that changes slightly and goes up, which is good news because of the two metre rule. But the either way option, I think the figure was a pretty dramatic one of about 40% extra capacity, which I couldn't ignore. It's a significant figure. It does deliver a significant step change in capacity. Uh, but within that, I think there are various uh, uh, options that we could consider. For example, limiting it to offences of up to two years of imprisonment. So that would mean that the more serious offences, certainly the uh, Section 20s, uh, ABHs, assault cases that have a five-year maximum would not be within uh, that particular re regime. Um, so there are different options that we can look, look at within it. Um, so I haven't yet finalised precisely where we, where we would land. But secondly, timing. You pressed me on timing. My view is that for this to have the sort of COVID effect that we needed to have, it would need to be in force as early as September. No good passing legislation that would come into force at the end of the year, for example. I think that is really, you know, stable door territory, um, which would mean that we would need to legislate on it before the summer recess. Uh, now, that's obviously uh, quite a high-pressure timetable. There's a lot of business at the moment, um, and it would need to be dealt with by both houses, uh, so that is quite a, a tall order, being frank with you. Uh, so I'm operating within quite significant constraints here, and therefore it, I think it's right to me not just to fix my sight on one option as the, the only solution, but to look at at least two legislative options that I've mentioned. Those are the two that I'm looking at. And then all the other non-legislative measures that we've talked about. OK. Mr Slaughter. Thank you. One, one final question, if I may. That, that does, I'm, thank you, Big Frank, Lord Chancellor, that does fill me with alarm. It does, this issue has been debated many times over the years as to whether to restrict jury trial, particularly either way offences. It's always been rejected. Mm. To, intro, to introduce it under the, 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 the cover of a, a national emergency, I think almost restricts the debate. And I'm sure all of us here are aware of the, the, the very serious implications. We haven't got time to go through all of the deficiencies of using an alternative to jury trials but one just one in particular which is uh, what the Lamy review found on this yeah. which is the effect in relation to prejudice on the basis of yeah. race and that it was found specifically that using the jury, the jury system was uh, an exception within the in the criminal justice system as something which did not have an institutional bias and that was specifically said to be in contrast with the way the magistrates' courts work. We all aspire to have a fair trial in all parts of the system, but by restricting jury trials, this is going to make an unfair justice system, and one of those aspects is on the basis of race, is it not? Well, uh, look, uh, you, you're right to mention that point, Mr Slaughter, and it's something that uh, I would uh, expect the judiciary to take the fullest account of when um, making sure that uh, benches are... Uh, suitably diverse. It's particularly important uh, when it comes to uh, trials. You're absolutely right to make that point. Uh, whilst I can't, of course, directly control listing or the operational administration of the courts, I would, as Lord Chancellor, expect the judiciary to bear the, the points that you've made, indeed that I make, 
very much in point when it comes to mitigating any uh, effects about inequality or lack of diversity when it comes to the makeup of the magistrates element of any panel. Uh, it's a system that we are familiar with. Of course, it is used in appeals against conviction and sentence to the magistrates' court, so it's not something totally alien to our system. Uh, and it is something, can I emphasise, that if it is done, would be temporary and would not, absolutely not, be the basis of a permanent change. I take the view that as Lord Chancellor, my job is to defend and uphold the right to trial by jury. Uh, the, the, you can imagine, therefore, what is going on in my head when I consider uh, the gravity of the situation and the natural reluctance I have to interfering with that in any way. So if there is to be any change, it will be temporary, it will be sunsetted, and there will be no secondary legislative power to extend the application of any change, by the way. So that would be you know, a hard and fast sunset that would go a long way to reassure parliamentarians that I mean what I say when I uh, um, uh, 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 indicate that I, everything that I want to do is to uphold and preserve jury trials that have been part of not just the life of this country but my own professional life for so long. Okay. So it is a big <coughs> important issue. On jury trials specifically, we're going to move on to other bits later, but we're going to bring Mr Daly uh, and Mr Butler. Now I'll move on to Ms Reed, to Ms Eagle as well. Lord Chancellor, just some very brief questions on covering a number of the points that you've talked about here today. Um, and I'm sorry to take back to my interest in the magistrates' courts, but um, can I just ask, are the magistrates now dealing with first appearances from the police station, and how widespread is that practice within the magistrate system at the moment? Yes. Um, again, Susan can get you the fully up-to-date position. My understanding is uh, that, again, we, we, a lot of technology has come in to play, but I don't know, Susan, whether you've got any uh, more up-to-date information. Yes, yeah, so just so I'm clear, the question's about dealing with first appearance from the yes. police station remotely. No, the, the, okay. sorry, I do apologise if i have not explained it clearly. When the Lord Chancellor last appeared before the committee, the courts were dealing only with remand matters. It appears to be the suggestion from the evidence given today that courts, magistrates' courts are now dealing with first appearances, so new offences charged by the police on bail. Is that correct oh, or not? Forgive me, forgive me. Uh, yes, we are starting to list gap and trend yeah. gap courts for all matters. We will still, so we're still giving priority to the most urgent cases, uh, but yes, we are seeking to list all matters in the magistrates' court now. Thank you. Um, second question. Um, I believe that release under investigation is a, is a sore in the justice system. And also, um, we don't have enough time here to discuss how bail matters have been dealt by the police throughout this. The police did a fantastic job. But we have hundreds, if not thousands, of outstanding criminal offences. Many, uh, should, should I put, that, that are very strong, <laughs> have a very strong evidential base that are not within the court system at all. Now, Lord Chancellor, I'm being unfair to you in the sense that how the police investigate matters is not your responsibility. But when you've been talking about delays within the system, I think you're talking about delays within the court with, it, the, with matters after charge. If, I don't know whether you've talked to the Home Secretary or other ministers, but potentially, if uh, justice, I think, is seen to be done, we are going to have hundreds of new matters being charged before the courts, hopefully, uh, because... I certainly believe that needs to be done. And I just wondered if any provision had been made for that level of work coming into the system, which certainly is not usual in the time frames that we're talking about. Well, look, I think you're right to highlight the fact that um, the effect of COVID has been, to some measure, to slow up the supply of cases into the mm. system. So I'll give you an example. We'd be talking about the Crown Court backlog. I think it would be fair of me to say that we've got to be realistic that there are some cases in the Magistrates Court that would otherwise have come up to the Crown Court by mm. now. So we've got to build that into the equation as well. So you take that right back through the system and you're right to talk about the uh, release under investigation cases. As you know, the Home Office have launched a consultation into it. It's our intention to change that system. But in the meantime, clearly, the police have been working very hard on uh, quite a lot of clear-ups. They've been executing warrants, uh, quite rightly, uh, which have resulted in more court appearances, and they have been investigating some major crimes. So 
already I'm having the sort of conversations, not just with the Home Secretary that you brought me to, but indeed uh, only recently I had a conversation with senior police officers. Hmm. And in that conversation, the request that we have uh, as HMCTS and the MOJ is for the police to help us identify some of those cases coming into the system, particularly the big, complex, multi-handed, the multi-defendant cases, which of course will take up a lot of time and space. And that is happening now. There is that dialogue. And um, as a result of interventions that I've had, I'm confident now that the police know what is required of them. Uh, and that means that Susan and her team will be in a better position to understand the nature of the flow. Thank you, Lord Chancellor. Just one final brief question. And I can only say this from a practical level, having appeared before as a, a solicitor and high courts advocate before the Crown Court. And in my practical experience, I, I, I may have misunderstood what was said, but it was suggested that trials were now being undertaken over three separate courts. I may have, I may have misunderstood. The vast majority of courts I've appeared in, and I suspect, Lord Chancellor, the, the same may well apply to you, with some of the social distancing guidelines which has been issued today by the Prime Minister in respect of other matters, I certainly think courtrooms, with a bit of imaginative thinking, can fit uh, a jury into one courtroom. And in terms of the people who need to be in the court, if you can fit the jury in, you've got two barristers, perhaps two solicitors, defendant, witnesses are brought into court. I don't understand on a practical level why you need three courts to run a trial well, in those circumstances. I, I can explain why. You need yeah. a retiring room for the jury and retiring room facilities are quite small and you're putting 12 people into a room with each other for a long period of time. You've got to give them the space. Uh, it's a safe and right way to operate and that's why you need that extra space for the jury. I mean. I think you and I, to be forgiven as practitioners, we, we will often see life from that side of the court, the mm. public entrance, council's row, the solicitor's bench. Let's not forget there's another dimension. You know, when I sat as a judge, it suddenly opened up another world to me of staff space, uh, judicial rooms, uh, retiring rooms for juries. Uh, that has to be factored into the equation as well. And when we talk as well about Nightingale Courts and scaling up, Let's not forget that not only do we need custodial facilities, we also need staff. And you've got to think of the staff levels as well who can uh, support uh, practitioners and judges in those courts. And also things like Wi-Fi and technological reach as well. So whilst nobody is more committed than me to scaling up capacity, and I've been, I think Susan would probably say that I've been sometimes a bit of a slave driver on this, there are limitations to what we can do based upon staffing and logistical support. Thank you, Mr. Butler. Maybe Mr. Butler. Just very quickly on this one, Lord Chancellor. Um, there's clearly a huge amount of controversy about any concept of, of getting rid of the trial by jury. We all understand that. We all agree with that. Rather than introducing new legislation, I just wonder whether there's any scope here to activate existing legislation that's on the statute books. I, I find myself surprised that I'm proposing this because I've never approved of it before. But what about temporarily enacting the legislation to give magistrates? the power to sentence up to 12 months, which would presumably mean they could retain some cases uh, for trial in their own courts that therefore wouldn't need to go to the Crown Court. That has already been through a very thorough legislative process. It's been fully considered. And again, could be, it could have a sunset clause, so it could be purely a temporary measure. Would that deal with a considerable amount of the backlog? Um, we've considered that, uh, Mr Butler, with regard to the options. We don't think that it actually yields the sort of step change that we would need in capacity. Um, I've been uh, you know, driving my civil servants on to look at all the options, thinking of many you know, in the bath, if you like, as to how we can do this. And therefore, you know, coming to, I think, two options that make the most difference is what you'd expect me to do, rather than sort of shilly-shallying my way through the summer, umming and ahhing, and in the meantime, seeing a, a backlog grow. Uh, that's why I'm being frank with the committee that you know the, the, these measures are, are not ones that fill me with joy, but they're ones that would be limited and ones that we would need quickly, sooner, rather than later. Okay. Primary legislation required for um, limiting jury trials. Primary legislation required to reduce the jury number. Yes, I think that um, would be right. The final thing that's been suggested, and I think Justice have done some work on this, is juries operating virtually, yes. uh, remotely. Yes. Um, 
I don't think that would require primary legislation, or would it? It, it would require one amendment, it seems to me, having spoken to the participants yes. in the uh, justice uh, experiment. Can I yeah. thank them as well publicly? Yeah. Because they've been doing quiet but really yeah. important work. Uh, we've had a retired judge, former Court yeah. of Westminster, yes. very experienced Crown Court judge who's been uh, presiding, uh, it's very senior counsel and indeed yeah. a great team of volunteers who've now done, I think, four trials uh, and have been sending me the information and I've been talking to them remotely yes. as well. Um, there would be a change that would it would involve the the defendant's options about the way in which they give evidence right uh, they have at the moment okay. I think it's optional uh, with regard to giving evidence remotely uh, if you were to sort of bolt in the zoom jury concept yeah. I'm using it as a, as yeah, a shorthand sure. uh, then I think you need to probably go that one stage further and make all parts of it compulsory if you like so there is an uh, issue there and of course there are natural concerns about remote justice and what that might look like and how people behave okay. remotely all these things have been the study uh, the result or the the uh, the focus of a lot of academic study i think where i am on it is that uh, i am uh, having listened very carefully to the participants more in favor of it than i was um, I gather that in Scotland they're going to move to using a system of remote juries as early as next month. So we will have a real life jurisdiction next door okay. using this system, which no doubt will help inform us. But again, I don't want to sort of rush into using that system. Okay. I think it needs a bit more evaluation, right. but I'm certainly not going to rule it out as an option okay. we could use as part of the way to deal with this. Okay, that's very helpful. Ms. Eagle. Thank you, um, Chair. And I, I must say, yes, I, I have similar concerns to those expressed by colleagues on the committee about the abolition of jury trials uh, for either way offences, even for a short period of time. And I hope that a different way can be found, uh, Lord Chancellor. I also don't think that legislating to do it within six weeks is, um, is, is very satisfactory either. I wonder if you could update the committee, um, Lord Chancellor, on the progress of other elements of the recovery plan. Um, for the criminal justice system and give us a bit of an idea um, about which of them will require legislation. Um, so to be specific, Ms Eagle, are you talking about uh, the court system or are we looking more widely at the no, penal the system as well? System, yes, okay. the court system, Lord Chancellor. Um, well, I must say that I've been um, extremely uh, um, encouraged by uh, the uh, COVID regulation based changes that we made uh, at the beginning of this crisis with the support of Parliament as a way of expanding the use of technology and I think that what we've seen and again Susan can come in with some more detail is uh, uh, in many jurisdictions um, uh, an effective management of the backlog in some jurisdictions, if family in particular, there has been a rise. So I am concerned about both public and private family law cases and the uh, potential backlog, well, the actual backlog we have there. But there have been some really good examples. So let's take the Special Educational Needs Tribunal. You know, a lot of us as MPs will have worried families who have to uh, undergo that particular uh, tr uh, process. That's been an example where technology is actually popular and families are saying they like it uh, all the early indications are that we'd want to retain remote technology as much as possible in that in that field because not only is it dealing with the caseload effectively and shortening waiting times it does seem to be a better uh, system particularly for families who might find it difficult to travel because of their care responsibilities uh, we've also had other good examples in other tribunals of the way the caseload has been managed. However, having said that, there are challenges, for example, with employment tribunals where we haven't been able to use and uh, to get technology uh, engaged because of uh, regulatory and legislative reasons. But um, we are anticipating what might happen with employment tribunals by seeking to change that to modernise the system and to be ready for any increase in claims that might be made, sadly, if we end up with a position with a high number of redundancies and people losing employment. Um, so that's just a little flavour, really, in the tribunal system. Um, Susan, I wonder whether you could come in as to uh, any other points more generally about 
the other jurisdictions and how we are managing uh, the current crisis. Yes, thank you, Lord Chancellor. So um, I think the, the question was, can we flesh out the rest of the recovery plan, and particularly any other areas which might need legislation? So there's a, a set of things that we're doing. The first is that early in the um, uh, early in the crisis, we reduced the number of courts we had open. As the Lord Chancellor said at the beginning, we're now well on the way to reopening all of the courts that we had closed. Um, and we expect to have all of our courts, save for a very small number, where there is a real challenge about operating them uh, at all with social distancing, because there's so little. Um, we expect to have uh, virtually all our courts open again um, by uh, the middle of July, and there is a, a set of courts opening every week at the moment. So we, we opened another um, 27 courts yesterday. Um, and uh, for all of those, we've done extremely thorough risk assessments and pieces of work to make sure we can operate safely. The second thing is to continue the work on hearing as much um, uh, suitable work by audio and video as possible. And the Lord Chancellor has spoken about that at some length. And we're also upgrading the equipment that we're putting in and the systems that we're using to do that. So early on, we really used whatever we had available. Um, and we're now rolling out um, I think the cloud video platform, which is essentially a better platform for um, those remote hearings. Uh, we've also uh, we've also been looking at some of the rapid evaluative work that's been done both in family and civil in particular by third parties to look at which hearings are most appropriately done remotely and which are best done physically. And we're also looking at um, moving towards hybrid hearings in some jurisdictions. So particularly in family, the president of the family division has written about trying to make sure that for those hearings where it's important that or where a particular party really feels they want to be present physically, they can be present physically where others can uh, attend remotely, a bit like this hearing here. Um, and then the third thing is, again, we've discussed this to some extent in relation to jury trials, but across the whole system we're looking at the hours of operation of the courts, because essentially where we've got less physical capacity we can use, if we can spread that out um, in time, then we can get more work done, and there are working groups with judicial leadership being set up to look at that uh, in each jurisdiction. And we're also looking at um, how efficiently we can hold remote hearings, again, with lots of judicial engagement and leadership, and at how we list for those virtual and hybrid hearings, because that effectively is different from the way that we would list for a physical hearing and may help to address some of the points I raised earlier about the intensity with which we can um, list in cases. In terms of things that require legislation, the, the things that have been being discussed so far around jury trials are the principal areas that require legislation. Um, the other um, thing that we're looking at is uh, as we move towards more remote hearings for first appearances from police stations, there's a restriction in law that says that the police end of the video link has to be supervised by, by a police officer. Uh, and that is restrictive from a police uh, resourcing point of view, where if, if the person was brought to court, they would be being supervised by um, uh, a PEX officer, and we, 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 we think we would need legislation to change that position, and we are interested in making that change in order to make the, um, uh, the position less resource intensive for police and colleagues who have supported us really um, incredibly well through this crisis. Um, uh, as indeed have Joe and her colleagues on making sure that we've got the video connections okay. that we need to present. Okay, thanks very much. It was Eagle. Thank you. And um, what what timeline do you envisage for um, implementing all of these arrangements that you're making to try and recover from COVID in the court system? When, when do you expect that to be done? I'm not asking when the backlog will finally be cleared, but when do you expect all of the provisions that you want to put in to attack it, being completed. So, so as I say, we expect to have all of the closed courts reopened by mid July. We're working actively now on opening additional court provision essentially as quickly as we can. So as soon as we identify at the open it, I think there's an extent to which some of this will be ongoing and will depend quite a lot on how circumstances change. So again, we've got provisions in our plan looking at what happens um, in the event that you have local lockdowns or other bits of reverse in the direction uh, and to some extent planning does depend on those external circumstances. Um, in terms of um
looking at um, the legislative program, I think the Lord Chancellor has given you an indication of timetable, but again, from, from a kind of operational point of view, we're trying to do all of these things as fast as we can. Um, and uh, we will, and in terms of getting the um, better video technology rolled out, that's well underway in Crown and Magistrates Courts, and the um, full rollout starts next week in Civil and Family Courts. And again, we'll, we will go as fast as we can, and we'll expect to see that rolled out and operating everywhere um, over summer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Lord Chancellor. Yes. Um, you've made some reference about how. Um, how you've discussed with the Lord Chief Justice the need for more sitting days and made some agreements in respect of this year. But what discussions are you having, given that you've got this greater appreciation of the backlog and the, the implications, about the need for more sitting days as well as longer hours um, in the in, to, in coming years? Because that's obviously one way of tackling the backlog effectively. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's a fair question. I, I mean, the, the way in which I think you know the negotiations work are based upon the year-on-year -year allocations in the different jurisdictions and it's not a multi-year exercise because of course flows change they ebb and they flow um, and a decision was made before my time uh, for example on criminal uh, hearings in the year 1819 or 1920 rather which uh, frankly was overtaken by events uh, and which uh, I don't think uh, was therefore foreseen by those who made the calculations upon which the decision was make and made back in late 2018, early 2019. Having said that, I think for this year, you know, the, the, set, the exercise is wholly academic. We need to find as much space as possible, use as much time as possible and get as many sittings as possible in order to get on with the work. Therefore, thinking ahead to the year 2021-22 um, has not yet taken shape uh, in a formal way. It's going to because I've been talking about my ambition to get things uh, sorted and manageable by Easter of next year. That will take us into that uh, new financial uh, year. And therefore, those conversations uh, are starting already. Um, I, I need to consider whether or not I just take an exceptional approach to this period generally anyway, uh, because uh, what I do not want to do is have a wholly uh, unrealistic exercise uh, deep in the middle of this particular challenge, which um, tries to make projections that frankly you know, will not be borne out by events or which are just too difficult to make. So um, I think this crisis gives us all an opportunity to just evaluate how the system works, whether or not it does need a change, whether or not it can be done over a longer period, or whether or not I need to uh, have a system that is perhaps even more flexible and that allows, you know, potentially in-year changes. Uh, because in effect that is what it, that's what happened last year when I did make some adjustments towards the end of the year to increase the sitting days by a few hundred for example so um, I think you make a really interesting point um, it's another item on my list uh, as I reflect upon the long-term effects of Covid upon the system and the opportunities that it also creates to improve the way in which we predict and provide for court sittings and the system more generally. All right. Okay. They, they, they Thanks. And the, the, the Lord Chief Justice actually told us that, um, um, that on the 22nd of May that the consequences of underfunding of the administration of justice were coming home to roost. I wonder if you agree with that assessment. Well, um, what I would say is that certainly in my time as Lord Chancellor, I've done my very best to try and uh, not just maintain the system of justice but to respond to rising demand and to provide for it. It's not an easy task. Uh, we know the history about uh, the department. Uh, we did obtain one of the largest, well, in fact the largest rise in many years last year, only a 5% rise in the uh, revenue budget, which I think is a very interesting sign, not just in itself but also the direction of travel. Uh, and the ambition that I have for my department, indeed the ambition the Prime Minister has for the justice system generally. So whilst I cannot sit here and 
uh, promise you uh, a Finian's rainbow with a crock of gold at the end of it. What I can say is that we uh, are going to continue the emphasis upon improving our justice system and understanding the consequences of expanding our police force, which is a good thing, but the consequences on the justice system that that will have. And I get a real sense of common purpose here with the Home Secretary and with the Prime Minister. People understand it, and the Treasury, most importantly, people understanding the fact that if you want a justice system that is going to work, you've got to pay for it. Uh, and that's the message that I think everybody now understands uh, uh, loud and clear from me and from my Ministers. All right. OK. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. I want to talk briefly about technology, Mr. Daly. Um, Lord Chancellor, I apologise for being negative, but uh, I will be. Um, I have a lot of um, colleagues who are practising before the magistrates' courts every day. Um, I agree that the use of technology is a positive outcome, but they report to me that the way in which it is being used at this moment in time causes delays in itself that the best part of an hour is taken up with the most straightforward of hearing. I don't blame anybody for this whatsoever. But when you have uh, a solicitor having to speak with their client and all the other things that, that are uh, we're, we're tackling within, within, um, within COVID, I just wanted to make a comment and ask for your comment, is that I don't think we should overlook the fact that um, in the magistrates' courts in particular, technology is creating delays as well. And I don't say that as a criticism, but I just wonder what your view is on that um, and whether there's anything that can be done to tackle it in any way. Um, I think that's a very interesting observation, Mr Daly. I, I, I think, certainly from my own experience of technology, it can be frustrating. And, of course, mm. if one part of the system isn't working Indeed. well, it causes huge delay. What I am impressed by, though, is the cloud video platform that is increasingly being rolled out to both the Crown Court and the Magistrates Court estate. That common platform that brings together the police with the courts, which allows everybody to operate on the same technology, the same uh, basis. Um, and certainly, again, Susan might have some observations here. Certainly what I'm hearing about the, the, the cloud video platform is that that is leading to greater efficiency. There is also, I think, an issue with regard to uh, legal conferences and access uh, lawyer-client interviews. Uh, that's been communicated to me frequently. And again, we are working out ways and are implementing ways of expanding that capacity to allow those vital conversations to take place. Because I know from my own experience that the conference with counsel or the the client's ability to give instructions in a confidential way, it's absolutely essential, it's a legal right, can then lead to greater efficiencies. It does lead to greater efficiencies within the system because clear instructions given, pleas can be entered at the right time, uh, and the system of justice is supported. So um, I think that what we need to do is not hesitate now, but actually drive forward qualitative increase in technology to make sure that the system is working in a way that speeds things up. But Susan might want to come in at this point about CVP in particular. Okay. Very briefly, Ms Ackland, talk because we've got a bit, a bit to get through, but Lord Chancellor's Mr Nation, well, okay, if the technology is good, fine, but okay, you could tell us that the cloud platform is a good one. Yes, I, mean, I, I think the Lord Charles has covered it well. I mean, we, we, I completely appreciate when we first introduced this, we were introducing a new way of working at incredible pace in a way that we would never normally do in normal yeah. times. And yeah. it's right to some places that have left things right. taking longer than they would have done. What we're doing now is learning much more about how to do this more effectively. And that's partly about the new technology, the cloud video platform. Okay. Actually, it's also partly about learning how to do it better. Um, as well as making sure we've got the kind of scale and the links we need. Understood. For example, into the client consultation, so they're not taking up court time. Good. Okay. No. It's okay. That's very helpful. No. Before we move off of courts, anyone else want to come back in on any courts issues? Any more technology issues, Ms. Eagle? No, you happy okay. with that? Can I just ask one question? Lord yeah. Can I just say, in respect to the use of courts within the magistrates' courts, I'm very. Manchester Magistrates' Courts is the court that I'm used to. Um, more courts. I think can be used. I think the a magistrate's court is a place where social distancing can take place. I fully accept the issues when you bring people on bail into the court system where they wait, mm. but um, practitioners tell me on a repeated basis 
that more courts should be utilised to deal with the work in magistrates' courts um, and the court, court capacity is there. Well, well uh, that's a helpful observation and it really builds on what Susan said earlier that the, the expansion in capacity isn't just about uh, you know let's set up a crown court in a civic building it's about actually having jury trials for example in magistrates courts where there's space and custodial facilities and then moving out the non-contentious and the family the chambers type applications to civic offices for example that could happen in many towns and cities across the country and it's that sort of approach that I think will okay. yield the quickest very results. Okay. Very Dr. Mullen, anything on the courts? No? Okay. Happy with that? Very happy with that? Right. There's been a lot of time on it, but it's an important and very yeah. topical issue. Prisons, Lord Charles, going to hand over to Paula Barker. Thanks, Chair, and thank you to our witnesses today. Um, if we look at the latest developments in prisons, obviously in relation to COVID 19. I think we seem to have uh, lost the sound. Uh, can Sorry, you there yeah. we go. Um, I'm okay. interested in some statistics mm. on how many prisoners have tested positive, how many staff have tested yes. positive, and how many staff are currently self-isolating. Yes, well, thank you very much indeed for that question. And uh, as of the 19th of June, with regard to uh, the current figures um, in prisons, we had, this is a cumulative figure, uh, we had um, 505 confirmed COVID cases uh, between the, the beginning of the outbreak and the 19th of June of prisoners, 984 confirmed COVID cases being suffered by members of staff, and that's the cumulative figure, and then sadly the confirmed deaths as of the 19th of June were 24 prisoners and nine members of staff in the prison service. The uh, testing figures, um, Joe, I think, might have the most up-to-date figures with regard to that. My recollection is the number of symptomatic prisoners is now around about 100 throughout the whole estate, but Joe uh, Farrow will have some more information about that. Okay. Welcome. Very nice to see you. Thank you. Um, so we have, at the moment, we ha on Friday, we had 107 symptomatic prisoners. That is likely to rise this week because we do have a wing in one prison in the northeast where um, we, we have uh, seen a number of symptomatic prisoners, so it may, it may go up a little bit this week. But we have generally seen that figure reducing. We have um, 2,897 prison staff who are off work on Friday the 19th of June uh, due to COVID, um, but that has reduced from a much higher figure when the um, epidemic started. Thank you for that. Just on that then, I'd be interested mm. to hear uh, Ms Farrow's opinion and also the Lord Chancellor's opinion um, that there is a number of rogue governors across the estate who have, an, have taken appalling risks during this crisis, which has actually led to unnecessary increases in cases of COVID-19. So I'd be really interested to hear what your views are on that. Well, I wonder if Joe wants to come in. I mean, I, I would first of all say that certainly from my experience, and I'm doing a Governor's Roundtable remotely this week, that the national scheme of uh, cohorting that we introduced, which is now in about 98% of our prisons, whereby for the first 14 days new inmates were quarantined and kept separate, existing inmates who were symptomatic were then put into a cohort, and then vulnerable inmates were also shielded, has really been the source of the considerable progress that we've made in prisons in limiting this uh, unpredictable and worrying disease um, and therefore we were faced at the beginning as I think every, every committee member knows with a, a very alarming and stark set of predictions which we responded to quickly with um, a, a, re a regime that I think has saved lives uh, and protected staff and has been supported by constant communication between staff and prisoners to allow prisoners to understand why it is that 
the significant restrictions that have been placed upon them have, have been carried out, but also in a way that gives them confidence that it's their safety that is being put first. But Joe might be able to come in with regard to specific issues about any local governance uh, problems. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd be very surprised um, to hear, well, I'm very surprised to hear that you feel there are um, a number of rogue governors. We have really strict governance around, um, around this process. In fact, we work really closely with Public Health England at a national and at a local level, and Public Health England also oversee the arrangements we put in place and have recently assessed that we've reduced um, the risk of people dying through this period from 2000 uh, to between two and 3,000 to around one to 200. And in fact, we have only seen 24 um, prisoners lose their lives as a um, COVID related, 21 of whom were either older prisoners or had an underlying health condition. So we do have a really strict process ar around um, how we operate in prisons. Um, Paul, Phil Coppel, my director general, speaks to governors every week. I speak to all of our senior leaders every week. Um, we have um, exceptional delivery models in place which set out exactly what needs to be done in each prison. I mean, if you do have any specific examples, of course, I'm very happy to follow that up. But I think we have had quite a, a success in prisons because of the way that we've operated. Thanks, Ms. Farrah. I mean, I'm happy to provide uh, additional information that you've requested. You mm. said that you speak to, obviously, leaders every week. Do you speak to the trade unions on a weekly basis? Because uh, the information I'm receiving from the trade unions is, is obviously converse to the information that you have. Yes, we work really closely with the trade unions. So either I or Phil Coppel speak to um, the trade unions uh, um, every week. Um, they, they feed back to us if they have any concerns and obviously we follow that up, but generally we've worked really well together. We've published um, a statement earlier to talk about how we've introduced the exceptional delivery model and how that has um, the support of the trade unions. We're issuing another statement today to show how closely we're, we're working together, but we, we've had um, real support from the uh, Prison Officers Association and the Prison Governors Association in terms of the measures that we've rolled out. I mean, I'm happy to, as I say, to provide that additional information, so I will write to you, um, because one of the prisons in Staffordshire um, actually, I'm led to believe, has the highest case of COVID-related incidents, so um, I'm happy to do that. And just, I suppose, mm. the final point from me that I'm interested in is that... Um, there's some prisons uh, that are described as um, the governors are being um, allegedly bullying, shall we say, and they're extending staff shifts, um, they're forcing overtime, but only using blue time instead of using the bonus scheme that has been brought in to deal with this pandemic. I'm just wondering what your views are on that, please. So again, we've been working really closely with the trade unions. They've been very supportive about the measures that we've brought in to make sure that we have enough staff to cover the pandemic. We do have um, different schemes in place, including um, overtime and, um, and bonus system to make sure that we have staff to cover um, the, the, uh, this period um, and even um, progressing through to the autumn. Again, I'd be really interested to follow up on any individual cases that you have, but that's certainly not the feedback that I've been receiving. In fact, staff um, have spoken very positively about the measures that we've put in place and the additional payments, um, which have really helped them um, to work during this period. Okay. Thanks very much. I'm, I'm, as I say, I'm happy to okay. follow up with the information and evidence that I have. Right. Uh, I think that will be really helpful. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks. Mr Bergen and then Mr McCastle. We're coming on this point, then I'll move on to Mr McCastle, Mr Bergen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, and my first question really is um, for the um, Secretary of State. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, today. So eight national trade unions, uh, which represent the majority of prison staff, uh, have asked you to support their safe inside recovery strategy, which is to protect all workers uh, in prisons. Now, as part uh, of that, they've asked if the government can introduce a Know Your Rights campaign and something I think is very crucial, a whistleblowing hotline 
which would be alongside a commitment to intervene to prevent contractors or rogue governors enforcing unsafe working practices. So would you be able to take this opportunity today, uh, Secretary of State, to make that commitment to workers and introduce the measures the unions are calling for, including very specifically uh, the whistle uh, blowing hotline? Well, thank you, Mr. Bergen. Um, I need to know more the fullest details about the proposals. Um, I'm always interested in and engaged in issues that will allow uh, uh, frontline workers to bring their concerns to the fore without fear or favour. That's got to be the sort of system we should all be working towards. And I think. Uh, I can say this without having looked at the detail, which I will do uh, as an undertaking to you. Uh, I, I absolutely share uh, and endorse the aims of any campaign that leads to that culture of openness. It's only through that openness that we improve the system. And uh, I find certainly when I was able to before the lockdown, the visits that I undertook to our prisons and our probation services were a chance for me to have those frank conversations on the front line with people who uh, were able to tell me frankly about the challenges they were facing and in confidence where appropriate. Uh, I value that. I would expect that every senior leader in HMPPS PPS should value that approach. And it does disturb me if there are examples and evidence, and if there's evidence of a failure of that approach because I think that's a failure of leadership um, and therefore uh, I will uh, consider very carefully what you've said uh, but you can be rest assured that the aims of openness and the aims of freedom of uh, uh, complaint uh, to coin a phrase are something that I very much share with the, the unions you've mentioned. That's very useful, Secretary of State, and thanks for that uh, commitment to uh, consider these proposals, including uh, the whistleblowing hotline, because one of the purposes, obviously, of the whistleblowing hotline is to ensure that both you uh, and the uh, chief uh, executive of uh, HMPPS uh, are aware where there are rogue governors. Uh, no one disputes the fact that the vast majority of governors are doing a great job in very difficult yeah. circumstances, but recently, uh, there was a meeting of the um, Justice Union's parliamentary group, and at that group, uh, the uh, national chair of the Prison Office Association, Mark Fairhurst, referring to a particular uh, prison, said, and these were his words, the governor there thinks he can play uh, God with people's uh, lives, and he gave a really uh, troubling uh, case study of appalling risks being taken, um, where, for example, uh, sessions were still being held in the chapel after lockdown, choir sessions, craft sessions, bingo, allowing prisoners to congregate in large groups. And so there are these unrepresentative instances of rogue governors. Now, I do think that a hotline would ensure that uh, workers in those prisons uh, can raise these very concerning issues very quickly without it escalating uh, in a way which ends up uh, bringing the whole operation in the prison uh, to a standstill unnecessarily. Okay. Are you happy to look at that? Look at that yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Mr. McCaskill? Uh, you need to unmute, Kenny. That's yes, just before we go on to specific questions, perhaps just following up from my colleagues. Uh, well, Chancellor, indeed, Ms. Farai, would you accept that the POA have been acting extremely constructively uh, in the dialogue that's been ongoing during this current dispute? And with that regard, could you tell us where things stand with regard to the peer review body that was due to be reporting in April? Yeah, well, first of all, I'll, I'll preface the remarks. I'll bring Joe in, but, but I can say, and I've said before to this committee, that the POA have worked extremely constructively with HMPPS and with me as well uh, in the approach they've taken throughout this crisis. I've endeavoured to do everything I can to support them. The bonus scheme was a, a case in point, uh, which really, uh, I think, signalled our uh, not just our, our words, but our actions when it comes to support for prison officers who were doing a job in incredibly difficult circumstances. And I think the relationship has been a very positive one. I'm proud of what they've done. I'm proud of them. Uh, and it's shown that um, when a crisis comes, we are at our best when we work 
together, but I'll bring Joe in with regard to uh, some of the other details. So thank you, um, Lord Chancellor. Yes, we've been working really closely with the POA and the relationship has been um, very constructive. We've been very grateful for, for their support. And just on the previous points, I'm very happy to follow up if, if they feel that there are individual prisons that are not operating properly. In, um, with regard to the um, pay review body, uh, their um, review was um, unfortunately slowed down by COVID, but we're expecting it to report very shortly. And we'll obviously consider um, what it has to say um, as, we, as we do every year. Um, and we will consult with the POA again, as we, as we always do. Okay. Right. Thank you. So, yes, Let's move on to some specific questions because obviously there are reports coming in from HMI, HMIP and indeed IMB about uh, isolation and some prisoners having been in symptomatic prisons having difficulties in having access to exercise and showers for periods of up to 14 days. How extensive is that and what's been done to try and address it? Well, uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr McCaskill, and um, I, I too have obviously been uh, uh, viewing all, all the inspection reports that have been coming in. I'm glad to say that where we have seen examples of a lack of sanitation, uh, those problems have been addressed with quickly, ad addressed very quickly, and addressed by the time of publication of the report. And in particular, I think I remember the situation at Coldingley was an acute one, uh, all the reports I had from uh, Joe Farr and other officials were that measures were then put in place to deal with the issues and in particular on the issue of shared sanitation we've moved progressively away from that type of accommodation which naturally caused huge anxiety to uh, service to, to prisoners and people using the service uh, staff I mean um, so we are taking action wherever we get reports of those problems then we make the necessary interventions. But I wonder whether Joe can come in to um, deal with a more wider point about other instances where we've seen those problems. Yes, absolutely. So where we, where we do um, see um, issues, I mean, we ho I hope we will have spotted most of them before um, the inspectorate does, but where, where they spot these issues, we act on them immediately. We have been able to give people access to regular shower showers. We have introduced um, a number of new units into prisons through temporary accommodation to allow um, much less um, double double cells. So we now have um, over 5,000 fewer um, people sharing cells since we had um, in February. Um, we I, also worth noting that HMIP also identifies areas of good practice. And today, um, Peter Clark has written to me to to. Uh, I, to show me that he's um, publishing on his website um, areas of notable practice. We'll be sharing those with governors so that so that they can all uh, make sure that they're implementing that best practice. Thank you. Obviously, there's a great effect there upon mental health. Can you tell us what's been done to monitor mental health, self-harm and indeed, sadly, suicide? Well, again, that's an issue of personal concern to me, and I think I've told the committee before that every uh, loss of a life, the taking of a life by self-harm, is reported to me individually as soon as it happens. Uh, so they're more than just mere statistics to me. Um, I, I have some figures here which I'm able to assist with the committee with. Um, first of all, in the three months to the end of May of this year, we there were just under 11,000 incidents of self-harm in the male estate. That's 10,999. That was down from the previous quarter, which had reported 12,433. But for the previous year for the same period, it was significantly down. The previous year, there had been 13,417 incidents of self-harm. Um, clearly, there's some COVID factor here. I think we need to obviously maturely reflect on it and understand what is happening, but there has been a more than statistically insignificant decline. Uh, and the female estate, there'd also been a decline in the last three months. Um, though looking at the figures, it seems to me to be not as statistically significant. 2,784 incidents of self-harm, that was down from the previous quarter, which had recorded 2,870, but the same period the previous year, just under 3,000, 2988. It's a welcome decline, but still 
I'm not going to pretend there isn't anything other than a very serious issue. And in the female estate, there is a particularly acute uh, concern that all of us who've uh, taken an interest in and debated the female offender strategy will know about. On self-inflicted deaths, again, the figures are fairly uh, and sadly consistent. In the three months to the 31st of May, we lost 20 prisoners due to self-inflicted death. That was slightly up from the previous quarter by three, but down from the same quarter last year, namely 23. Um, as I've said, I think the committee are owed um, a, a mature reflection about this issue, and I think it's frankly glib of ministers to start making any headline comments about mental health trends. But what I am hearing from officials and from the estate is that prisoners are responding in different ways to isolation. Some prisoners are finding it uh, very hard and very difficult, which is why in-cell telephony, video facilities, ability to con connect with families is so important. But other prisoners are finding it's it actually a, a slightly easier regime in the sense that they are more worried about contact with other prisoners and find that difficult aspect of prison life. So it does very much depend upon the individual prisoner and how they react. But I think generally speaking, it would be right of me to say that the prison recovery plan that we published on the 2nd of June gives us the pathway out of the current highly restrictive regime that we have brought in because of COVID. And I think reading that should give, and I'm sure the committee will have, will give the committee a very clear idea about, it is, about what it is that we want to do. So, for example, the progressive reintroduction of visits to prison to allow prisoners to see their families, the reduction in the number of hours in which prisoners spend in their cells so that more exercise can happen and more uh, uh, freedom can be allowed. All these things are within our plan, uh, but of course our plan is based very much upon uh, the imperatives of the community-based plan and the R-rate and the need to keep prisoners and staff safe. But uh, we are busy communicating with our prisoners, making sure that they know what is to come and that as uh, the lockdown restrictions change within the community, then we can reflect that as well in the prisoner state. So communication, I think, is everything if we are to minimise the mental health effects upon uh, prisoners. OK. Thank you. <clears throat> Mines everywhere are now beginning to turn to the easing of lockdown, given that its prison situation has been ongoing for almost 13 weeks. Can I ask with regard to that, uh, when you propose to start uh, the uh, easing restrictions in prisons, what criteria will be set for each prison that, uh, that they'll have to meet to allow that? And indeed, specifically, what arrangements will be made in the uh, criteria and at various levels with regard to activity level and indeed access to exercise, mm. and perhaps finally as well? Uh, what will be done to ensure that the control that prison staff now have is maintained? Well, thank you, Mr McCaskill. And again, I'm able to refer to the uh, recovery plan that we pub published, the National Framework Plan that we published on the 2nd of June, which clearly sets out, not just in written, but also in um, chart form, the stages which we will operate in our prisoner state in accordance with the level of infection in the community. Uh, we have, uh, as you know, five stages, which range from number five, which is a complete lockdown, uh, right down to number one, where we are in a position of a benign uh, uh, state of no known infections. Uh, there are clearly gradations within that. So lockdown stage four has been uh, where we've been uh, in most recent uh, times. Um, but you can see there that moving down to level three, for example, then allows um, a change in the delivery mechanism. So we can have visits, we can reintroduce classroom-based education, we can reintroduce offender management work and offender behaviour programmes with the appropriate safeguards and adaptations. So in other words, very similar to what you've seen uh, in the community that the uh, government in, in the Westminster and the Scot Scottish government, the Welsh government have produced a similar scheme within our prisons and also a scheme that doesn't 
apply and will not apply uniformly necessarily. It might look uh, different in different prisons according to the prevalence or level of uh, the disease. And therefore, I think we have a sufficient flexibility within an agreed uh, and um, carefully calibrated framework, which was the product of consultation with, uh, with staff and with the unions, that gives everybody, prisoners included, a high degree of certainty as to how we will manage our way back towards uh, the, uh, shall we say, back into or, or forward into a post COVID scenario. So I do commend that document to the committee. Uh, I don't know whether Joe has anything to add to what I've said. Right. Any, does um, that right. all come in? All sure, come right. in? Should, I, should I just come in on the governance? Um, because the Lord Chancellor has summed up exactly where we're going. We're very keen to move to the next um, stage. So at the moment, we have, we're have we developing a number of exceptional delivery models for um, stage three. We're agreeing those this week with the trade unions. We also have local prison governors are preparing their local plans to make sure that they are ready um, to open up and as soon as those are ready and signed off we have agreement with the trade unions and public health England are comfortable for individual prisons to move forward then we can start to relax the regime so we hope that that will happen uh, within the next few weeks. Right, I just wanted to bring Mr Butler quickly on regimes before we move uh, on Mr McAsper. Uh, Yes, Lord Chancellor, I wonder if we could just touch on the youth estate. You, you've talked about the male estate and, and the female estate. I wonder if you could give us the picture in the youth estate, um, referencing back, for example, self-harm um, and uh, what's being done to protect uh, mental well-being. And then in terms of, of regime, we know that uh, in, in the wider community, uh, school children may not have been going to school, but they've been getting online lessons. Um, the same hasn't been true for, for the children in our uh, custodial establishment. So I wonder how quickly we might move to them getting a full education offer. Well, for, well thank you, Mr Butler. There has indeed been one uh, uh, exception to that, and that's at Her Majesty's YOI Park mm. uh, in Bridgend, where they have actually continued to deliver some education, mm. which I think is commendable. It's obviously been done in a, in a, in a safer way as possible. Um, I'm not shaming other institutions by, by reference to Park, but I think it is interesting to know that that was achievable. Mm. I understand the concerns and we've listened very carefully to representations from, from staff and the unions about uh, not rushing into a situation where suddenly uh, we're, we're, we're putting people in quite close proximity to each other, which of course uh, does happen with education. But it's certainly our uh, ambition as part of stage three to get uh, education running again in a safe and sustainable way in an agreement with uh, the unions. With regard to the youth uh, estate, um, uh, it's right to say that uh, there have been particular uh, challenges, I think, that have faced staff there, not so much from an outbreak or vulnerability, but from the fact that young people really naturally struggle with the concept of a lockdown. Uh, whether it's in the community or, or not, and it's even more acute in the youth estate. Mm. And therefore, the management of young people, keeping them calm, keeping them safe, making them understand why it is that the particular regime has to be involved, has been quite a, a task. It's been a task executed, I think, very well by the staff. And it's one that I think that, uh, as we go into the summer, is going to be even more important in terms of managing their expectations. I think we've entered a period, uh, really, we're st still in, in a long period of a marked decline in the number of young people we actually keep in detention. Uh, when I think back, you know, 10 years ago, the number of children in detention was probably about three times where it is now. And where we are now is a figure of, of around about, I think, in total, if you include all secure accommodations, about 700 or so. Um, but we have seen, as you say, in absolute numbers, a progressive reduction. Um, Joe might want to come in with some more details as to uh, what the next steps are, but thus far I think we can safely say that we uh, and the staff have done everything they can to keep young people occupied, to, to make sure that they can talk to their families as much as possible. But again, I can't deny that there have been stresses and strains and particular anxieties amongst the families of young people mm. who quite naturally would like to have greater opportunity to interact, which just has not been possible because of the restrictions. But I don't know whether Joe wants to add any more. We, we, we're going to need to move things along a bit uh, because time presses on us. 
I'll be very quick. So, um, yes, we have been watching uh, the youth estate very carefully. We've been particularly concerned about our children. We have um, a small number of um, young women who um, who, who uh, um, do tend to self-harm. So we, we have um, a package of support around those, around those young women. Um, also other people in the youth estate um, who tend to self-harm more than others. We've been um, issuing um, technology in for sales for some of our young people to make sure that they um, have opportunities uh, for distraction as well as distraction yep. packs. Um, we prioritise them for video hearings as well, video uh, facilities as well, so that they can keep in touch with their families. Okay, that's, her. that's very helpful. Uh, Ms McCaskill, do you want to move on to population issues, I think? Yes, uh, can I ask how many temporary single occupancy cells have been installed? How many are actually in operation? And perhaps also just how much have they cost? Yes, well, I can give you the latest figures as of Monday, Mr McCaskill. They've, they've now, we've now had the delivery of 896 units across 26 sites. Uh, 477 units have been installed and are ready for use. 289 of them are now being used. We've also opened up an annex at HMP YOI Rochester to hold up to 70 males. 32 cells are currently in uh, use and it's our intention to go further with regard to that accommodation because we think it will have some long-term benefits with regard to the way in which we can manage maintenance on the prison estate and therefore this is not, I'm glad to say, uh, a one-off investment that will uh, only have limited use. It will have, I believe, longer-term benefits. But perhaps Joe can uh, update us with regard to where we are with cost. Yes, thank you, uh, Lord Chancellor. I was just um, looking for the costs. I don't have the figures in front of me, but I can certainly let the committee have those. Um, to us, that would be the easiest thing at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, Mr. Anything else, Mr. McCaskill? Thank you very much, Mr. Slaughter. Then, Mr. Then, Dr. Barry. Uh, yeah, yeah, just, just uh, Lord Chancellor, if I may, if we're on the figures. Yeah. So about 289 temporary cells of the of the 2000 promised are in use at the moment is that right that, that's right end, 300 or so yeah just under 300 about about, about 300 uh, um, question on that well, do you think that's good progress sort of three months into the the covid crisis and at the other the, the other thing we obviously looked at in terms of numbers was the early release scheme yes um, builder builders 4000 i think revised down to 2,000, and that's the number of tags that were were purchased. And the latest figure I saw for that was about 150 plus. Yes. Is that right? And do you think that's a success so far? Um, in, in a nutshell, yes. Uh, I think uh, the combined approach of increasing capacity, shutting down capacity that was particularly unsuitable in COVID circumstances was absolutely the right way to go. Uh, and again, Joe can testify to this, but I was extremely anxious to push extra capacity from the earliest stage. I take into account the fact that these things need to be properly procured and we need to make sure that we obtain the sort of accommodation that uh, whilst it might not be uh, um, uh, permanent in the sense that it is a permanent construction is uh, very akin to a lot of the constructions that we do have particularly on the open estate and this is capacity that is being used at category D level the next stage is for me to scale up temporary accommodation at category C level <clears throat> of course that would require slightly higher levels specification when it comes to security but as I said in response to the answer to Mr McCaskill, this isn't some short-term fix because these units will be able to be redeployed across the estate. And where, for example, we're doing a big maintenance job in one prison, we can use this capacity to house prisoners in a safe and dignified way whilst doing the work that's needed to be done on the rest of the estate. So I think there's a long-term benefit here. With regard to early release, the number of 4,000 was uh, indeed a potential number of eligible prisoners that we were looking at, particularly in the early days of understanding this outbreak when we were facing some, frankly, pretty uh, concerning and very high numbers from PHE about uh, what it, the number of people who uh, the prison service could safely accommodate. 
uh, and therefore it was, I think, right then to recalibrate to look at uh, what actually was necessary in terms of the overall fall in prison numbers and to apply a rigorous uh, control check on people being released from custody. So each one of these people has been tagged, they've been uh, subject to a rigorous check um, and the sort of checks that I think the public would uh, demand of us the combination figure now, I think, is yes, the latest figures of Friday is 175, of which 23 were pregnant prisoners or prisoners with very young children, and 20 were extremely vulnerable, that is, people with a very serious health condition. Um, so, whilst the total might, in the context of uh, the whole uh, um, pandemic, uh, look like a low one, it must be accompanied by the fact that. Since February, when we were, I think, near to 84,000 prisoners, uh, the numbers uh, on the prisoner state in total have now dropped by about 4,000, and they stand at about 79,500 as we speak. Um, and that in itself has been a, a very significant contribution to the, the headroom issue that PHE identified and which we have endeavoured to follow. The work goes on. Uh, we aren't uh, saying that we are near mission accomplished. That would be, I think, inappropriate, bearing in mind the fact that the work in prisons is never done. But we are making huge progress in not just getting the right capacity, but also managing uh, the prison population in a safe way that has resulted in mercifully few fatalities uh, uh, within the prison population. Thank you for that. I mean, that's, that's very clear in the sense that, yes, there have not been the number of deaths you, you expected. That's clearly good news. The fewer people are coming into prison compared with those leaving. But are you then effectively saying, is your target still 2,000 for the temporary cell? And on the early release, are you effectively saying, not that you've abandoned it, but you've stood it down? So you're, you're looking at about 5% against the original target. That looks like, if it's a deliberate policy, you, you, you've stood that down as, as, as a policy. Um, I think it's f fair. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to make a binary choice here. I'm going to stick to the 2,000 target on increased capacity. I think that's absolutely right, and I want to drive that on. And, of course, we continue. We, we, we weren't just looking at the prison estate. We were looking at other government estate as well, and that work continues uh, with regard to identifying potential suitable accommodation that would meet our specifications. But uh, with regard to the early release, I'm not standing it down. I'm still using it in a, in a careful way. Um, uh, and it's still, I think, a useful uh, additional tool to have, bearing in mind uh, the need to be flexible. And the one thing that this uh, pandemic has taught me uh, uh, as a minister is that um, putting all one's eggs in one basket is not the way to manage this sort of crisis. And that's why I was uh, anxious with my officials to be as imaginative as possible, to try and find a range of different ways of tackling the problem, uh, understanding the, the fact that the prison estate isn't a monolith, it's a myriad of different types of institution uh, with different um, ways of working, and just trying to, within that, provide a sense of national coordination but then giving us a series of choices, series of options, if you like, that can be used at any one time in order to achieve the overall goal of making the estate a safe one. And, of course, following the advice that we were given by PHE. And I think, in large measure, we've been doing that, but we've just got to keep going and keep our eye very firmly on the ball. OK. Just, one, one more question, if I may. I'm just looking at a letter that the Prison Reform Trust and Howard League sent you on the... 15th of June. If I could just quote a couple of sentences from that. It says, most people in prison are either in prolonged solitary confinement or in overcrowded conditions. Prisons are devoid of purposeful activity and opportunity for people to make amends. Children in prison have no education. Rates of self-harm in women's prisons have increased and the entire estate has been starved of contact with the outside world. Open prisons no longer serve the function of preparing people for the community deaths in prison are rising. My, my question is, do, do you agree with that analysis? Uh, no, no I, I, I don't agree with it. Uh, it doesn't acknowledge, actually, the 
statistics accurately, um, I, that's not me playing it down. You know, deaths in prison are something uh, anybody who knows and has engaged with me on it knows troubles me hugely. Uh, and the sense that prisons aren't places of purpose, again, troubles me. What they're doing is describing a situation of lockdown. And, you know, lockdown has resulted in a significant change in the way we run prisons. And, you know, not having education, not having uh, exercise has been part of that. And that's been a sad fact of life for prisoners. But it's been a fact of life for all of us in the community as well because we've lost a lot of our freedoms as a result of this. And therefore, I, I find that a lot of prisoners, when you explain that, and I've been on prison radio to say just that, understand it and accept it as they see their families and friends having restrictions. But what that letter, with respect, ignores is the recovery plan that we published a fortnight before it. And we set out in the recovery plan what our aims are and what we want to do in order to allow things like education, allow visits, allow exercise. So the idea that somehow my officials and I have been sitting back uh, and being inactive on this is just wrong. Uh, And rather than um, sending letters that, uh, uh, if you like, um, uh, emphasise the problems and the challenges which are there and which we all know about... um, I think it, what we need is a sense of constructive uh, working together on these issues, identifying the problems, being honest about them, as I hope you think I have been, and then doing something about it. And that's what the recovery plan does. Uh, and now, as we move in the community into a new phase in July, I want to see that happening in our prisons too, but in a way that is safe and saves lives. OK. Going to have to be the last one. We are pressed for time. Right. Terms of your ambition, but do you actually disagree with the factual content of that? Um, well, some some of it is, I'm afraid, wrong, and I've set out some of the information about, uh, particularly self harm. I think there was an issue about rates of self harm. I'd given the figures in relation to absolute numbers in the female estate. And I I will think about that because I know the female estate has declined by several hundred in terms of overall numbers. So there might be an issue about rate. And can I just say that I'm not dancing on the head of a pin. I know the problems about self-harm in the female estate. I've seen them for myself. I've talked to women inmates and I've seen the results of self-harm. And it's something that we, we are seeking to tackle in the female offender strategy agreed two years ago because a lot of it is based upon trauma that women have experienced prior to their incarceration. So I'm not minimising or poo-pooing what that letter says. But what I am saying is that rather than... Uh, constantly confronting in an adversarial way, I'd like to see a little bit more acceptance of the realities of the situation within which HMPPS and I are working and the fact that we are all united in our desire to save people's lives, to keep people safe and to do everything as possible to provide a humane regime but consistent with the the demands of the Covid crisis. Okay. Dr. Mullen. Thanks. Uh, I want to move on to talk about uh, pepper spray, uh, the deployment of pepper spray in prisons. So there were more than 9,000 assaults on prison staff last year. More than 900 of them were serious. Uh, I've seen recent examples of prison officers being uh, jumped on, on their head by a prison with both feet, being assaulted by a 12-inch metal bar, having been given a concussion from a prisoner swinging a, a billiard ball and a sock. These are just some of the things that you can quite easily... Uh, see reported in the media, to what extent was those kind of incidents part of why you think it's important that we do give uh, prison staff the option to deploy pepper spray? Well, well, well thank you very much indeed, Dr Mullen. Some of the um, uh, examples you've given are a stark reminder of the danger that prison officers and staff face every day. And some of the incidents of assault have been frankly appalling. Uh, I, for one, have been a very active support of using supporter of using the prosecutorial system to deal with these assaults uh, which can often result in life-threatening injury Uh, and indeed we will be consulting very shortly on the assaults against emergency workers legislation with a view to potentially increasing the maximum sentence available under that particular law that was passed by Parliament uh, in, in the last few years. So I want the message to go out very clearly that I will do everything I can to support our dedicated prison officers. Parva spray has 
been, uh, I think, a very important additional element, uh, which I think is necessary, uh, and which I think is, uh, with the right training, absolutely a safe and sensible uh, option for prison officers to have. And what we've sought to do is balance out the need to get this rolled out as quickly as possible across the estate, with the need to make sure that there's the appropriate training and support for officers in their use of it. It has frankly been a source of uh, some debate. Uh, I know the, the unions are very anxious for me to get on with it uh, and they make their case very powerfully to me regularly but at the same time I have to recognise that I wouldn't want to expose inadvertently prison officers to uh, legal challenge whether it's direct or indirect and I have to make sure that the regime is absolutely within uh, what the law will allow. Covid has I think uh, presented us with particular challenges as a result of that, I think rightly, we took a decision to issue PAVA more widely, uh, and now it, it now is in 81 of our prisons. 23 of them were sites that had already been issued PAVA prior to the exceptional arrangements, and 15 of them had already passed readiness, so they passed the eligibility uh, stage. Yes, we've gone further than that in some short order, but frankly, in this, these exceptional circumstances, for me, the safety of staff was paramount and uh, it was essential that we gave them all the support that they genuinely required and this was the case and what is important to remember is that uh, locally in the remaining sites where we have issued PAVA uh, the staff who use them are trained uh, they have the requisite training they have the requisite support and all the sites have the, uh, the, govern the, the good governance uh, toolkit as they call it in other words the guide uh, alongside uh, the uh, general guidance for the use of PAVA and indeed support from HMPPS as to how to use it safely. Of course I'm going to have to review those arrangements once we get through the emergency but it okay. is my aim to make sure that we roll out PAVA in a permanent way with uh, all the, the safeguards that I know are in place. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I know it's in use in a number of other jurisdictions, Sweden, New Zealand, Canada, so this is something that's not unusual for a, a, a prison service to be making use of. Have we learned any lessons or can we learn any lessons from its use in other countries and um, that we might bring to bear on our rollout? Well, yeah, I, I do think that already we've learned from those other jurisdictions about uh, how a proportionate use of that type of spray really can uh, not just protect prison officers but actually to a greater sense of order as well within our prisons and therefore uh, we've taken that learning we continue to adapt it uh, we constantly look at the data that we get from uh, the use of it I think the latest information I have is that since the 21st of April there were 28 PAVA recorded incidents but of those uh, only, uh, in only 12 of them was the spray actually administered and again, that will show you that just because a PAVA uh, um, uh, implement is, is, is drawn, it isn't then inevitable that it's going to be administered. And that, I think, can give people a high degree of confidence that the approved techniques are being adhered to, and that, of course, any failure to do so uh, means that there's a chain of accountability yeah. about these okay. things. And prison officers know that. We're monitoring the use of force. We've got a national tactical that. response group. Uh, we are uh, uh, using that to monitor uh, across the system what is happening. And I'm confident that uh, as a result of what we've done, we will keep uh, staff safe and frankly keep prisoners safe okay, okay. as and, well. Uh, I, I, I think I would uh, echo those sentiments and, and the, the value of its use. I guess the, 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 the obvious question that arises though that is that whilst uh, of course COVID has produced uh, challenging circumstances, those circumstances, particularly in relation to the high degree of lockdown, the reduced interaction of prisoners, might not lend themselves to increased uh, risk of violent incidents. And so there is that obvious question of was there necessarily, whilst I support the use of it, what would be the justification for making the rollout quicker if perhaps there wasn't necessarily a COVID-related increases in violence or behaviours you might want to control? Uh, again, uh, Joe Farrah might have a view about this, but I, I think my, my in, instinctive re response to that is, yes, you're right about the number of assaults. They've actually gone down as a result of what has happened. But I think the fear was that um, it, 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 this, COVID isn't just a physical danger. It's also a mental challenge to us all because it's the fear 
of the spread of the outbreak that can cause anxiety, can cause instability. And in an institution like a prison, it only takes a few things to suddenly spark a problem. And you know, prison officers have jail craft, they have the ability to de-escalate and diffuse uh, hundreds of problems a day, uh, and they do it quietly and they do it in a brilliant way. But there come moments when suddenly a little thing can spark something quite significant. And I think it was felt, and I certainly shared that view, that having this extra element uh, at the disposal of prison officers at this particular time was frankly the right thing to do. Okay. Uh, I just want um, to ask... Um, sorry, go on, Joe. Sorry. Yeah, very quickly, please. <laughs> Perfectly. Um, yes, so at the beginning of this, when we assessed the situation, we had never been in a situation before where we were going to lock down prisons for such a prolonged period of time. Yeah. Obviously, we were worried about what might happen in the estate and wanted to make sure that we had the ne necessary protections in place to make sure our staff were safe um, and minimise the risk of disorder. It, it has been a very exceptional time, but we are looking to continue the role of that harbour as we promised um, as soon as this outbreak is over. Okay. Uh, on. I just want to ask about the, uh, the MOJ Equality Impact Assessment. And uh, I think it's important to have on the record that whilst uh, it, it did identify in pure numbers sense uh, an increased use or deployment uh, in relation to prisoners of BME background. Mm -hmm. The study was very clear in saying that, that the sample sizes and the individuals concerned were too small to draw any conclusion actually about the use of uh, this tool in relation to particular ethnicities. But we do know when we look more broadly at the use of force, there is better evidence base that it is not necessarily deployed in a proportionate manner. Uh, and so in relation to that, uh, what steps do you think are appropriate for you to take to monitor the wider rollout of that tool and, and whether it does translate to a disproportionate use? Well, it's clearly very important that we uh, not just monitor it, but actually take appropriate action if we think that the disproportionate use of force is as a result of a systemic problem or failure. And that's why the National Tactical Response Group, we've also got the National Dog and Technical Support Group as well, another form of restraint of course, the use of prison dogs, uh, allows us to look at the data and then to not just crunch the numbers but ask the question why uh, and it's through those national uh, bodies that I think we can improve. So we already have uh, within our staff training programme unconscious bias training that is mandatory for all staff but we're also developing more training based upon the evidence to improve that awareness about the fact that whether we like it or not we carry biases and therefore adjusting our behaviour to take that into account has to be part of it. Um, I think it would be perhaps wrong of me not to take this chance to say that when it comes to BAME and the criminal justice system, we still have a heck of a challenge ahead of us. We are making progress. A lot of the recommendations made in the Lamry Review have been implemented. I think 16 of the 35 have been completed, but I want to get on with completing the rest within the next year. Uh, I think we can do that. Uh, and I think that uh, that means that that body of work can be properly completed uh, and we can play our part, of course, as we develop our new independent review and okay. take the work forward to make sure that we are as effective as possible in providing a criminal justice system that is, uh, uh, provides equality for everybody right. within the law. Okay. Understood. Thank okay. you very much, Dr. Thank Bart. you. Mr. Butler. I wonder if we could move on to probation. Uh, Lord Chancellor, and, and, and specifically uh, your recent announcement that you're going to bring pretty much all probation services back under the control of the National Probation Service. Um, I don't want to, to ask you to rehearse the same arguments again, not least because of the uh, limited time we have remaining this afternoon, um, but I do recall that you mentioned that the coronavirus crisis had been one of the triggers um, for that decision. Private sector providers were given very little notice of the potential uh, change of heart. I wonder if you could just explain a little bit more why they were given so little notice and so little option to potentially put forward alternatives which they felt were sustainable. And given that there was such a big shift in, in focus away from the private sector, does that worry you at all that there may be now a lack of trust in the future when the Ministry has uh, given an undertaking um, that is then, um, I'm afraid the only way to bluntly put it is, is reversed. Well, well, I think it's a fair question to ask, Mr Butler, but I, we had to make decisions under extreme pressure. Um, the uh, 
probation reform programme was announced when I was Minister of State last year by my predecessor, so that was about a year ago. The aspiration then had been to complete the reforms by the spring of next year. That clearly became, uh, frankly, an ambitious target. Uh, I wanted honesty from my officials, and they told me that, frankly, frankly, summer of 21 was when it was going to be achieved by. So we already had, I think, a necessary adjustment in terms of the timetable. Um, we made the announcement relating to the bulk of the work as opposed to the unpaid work provisions and those parts that we wanted the private sector to still be involved with. Um, but then came COVID, and it did change everything. Uh, and frankly, the viability of a process uh, that we wanted as many participants to take part in uh, in the context of COVID was going to be difficult. And frankly, I had a choice to make. Should I just postpone the reforms off into the blue yonder or should I keep to the timetable that we had publicly set ourselves and which had already been slightly adjusted uh, in any event? Uh, I decided that it was right to keep to the timetable. Why? Because I have a wide duty, not just to those parts of the system that... Uh, provide the services that the CRC has provided, but also to the National Probation Service as well, and the need to make sure that any transition period was as um, smooth and as non-disruptive as possible. And I took the judgment that it would not be right for me to, in effect, keep things in suspended animation, running a system that uh, I think had run its course. Uh, and promising change but not then delivering it and of course things would have been increasingly out of kilter with what's, what we've done in Wales where we have implemented the merger for want of a better phrase and that new model started at the beginning of this year uh, and I was conscious that we would have staff on different regimes uh, you know, some working for the NPS, some working for CRCs, some working in the Wales service, frankly they needed I think to be a high degree of certainty here and therefore weighing it all up looking at the options and there were a number of options we could have perhaps uh, uh, extended matters by some months or moved to uh, perhaps a govco type provision i just thought it was far better and far more uh, straightforward to, and i owed it i think to everybody uh, who had an interest in this to uh, be straightforward and to come to a decision that yes meant an end to uh, the current situation with regard to their element, but which I think now clears the decks and allows us to get on with a dynamic framework uh, model, which already is up and running on the website and which is already inviting tenders and bids for the sort of provision that I think the previous model never actually got round to delivering properly. But how can we make sure that in the future... Um, if the Ministry of Justice wants private sector provision for, for any, any role, or indeed any other government department, potentially bidding firms can be sure that the government means yeah. what it says. It, it, look, that's a really important point, and that's why in my statement I made the point that we will carry on with our mixed economy approach. So look at prisons, for example. Uh, very active involvement of the private sector in our prisons. Keir is currently building the Wellingborough uh, prison project. It's doing a really good job. It's employing a proportion of ex-offenders. It's uh, managed to keep it going through COVID. It only fell a few weeks behind schedule, amazingly. Uh, that's a really good example of private sector involvement. And as we scale up and build modern prisons fit for the future, uh, I'm going to need their support and investment in order to deliver it. And the message I'm sending to the market is a very clear one. We are open for business and we want the mixed economy to prevail. And in terms of sending messages to the staff, um, I think you will remember, as I remember, when Transforming Rehabilitation first came in, staff were in a, a, what was a, the equivalent of a national service um, and they were very reluctant to move to the private sector. Quite a number that I visited in, a, in my previous role actually said, do you know what, to our surprise, we really welcome it. We've been allowed to be more innovative. We've, we've been more empowered. Um, is there a way that you can ensure that the benefits that have been brought to staff and then onwards to the people, that, the offenders they're looking after, can be retained as they move back into the National Probation Service? Well, I think my officials have got a very clear steer for me that that's exactly what I want to happen. Uh, I do not want uh, those talented uh, probation officers, their public servants, feeling in any way uh, encumbered or stymied uh, 
uh, when they come back into the National Probation Service. There's plenty of room, I believe, for the sort of imagination and innovation that we've seen. Um, and frankly, uh, I would expect no less. It may well be that Jo Farah has something to say, and I very much hope she will echo the comments that I've made about harnessing the best of what we've seen in the private sector with the new uh, national framework. So what Ms. Ms. Farah has to say? Absolutely. Just very quickly say that that's absolutely the case. There's some really good practice in the private sector. We want to bring that um, together with the good practice in the public sector so that we have a really high quality probation service. So I'll be very supportive of the comments um, that the Lord Chancellor's made. And we're also um, working very closely with our trade union so that we can bring people uh, across from the public <coughs> private sector as harmoniously as possible. And finally, Ms. Farrow, very briefly from me on this one, um, w w there are several players in the private sector. All their systems are going to need to be brought in and merged with your public se sector model, and, and those private sector ones will all do things slightly differently. Are you <coughs> confident that the time scale to do that is achievable? Because some of the private sector operators themselves are rather nervous about that. Yes, we are confident and we're working really closely with our public sector to pro provide us on the transition as we have been um, in Wales where we saw quite a smooth transition. Thank you very much indeed. Right. In terms of timelines, Ms Farrah, what, what's, what, when, are you, when are you going to be moving from step to step two of the road to recovery? You're in um, exceptional delivery model at the moment. When are we going to start moving from that onwards? So we're consulting <coughs> at the moment. We promised um, at uh, our partners that we will give them two weeks notice so um, within the next couple of weeks we want to be um, uh, as with prisons opening up our probation services and having more face-to-face -face visits and when can we, yeah, I guess say because what when can we expect to return to something like normal levels of supervision because at the moment it's very limited indeed yeah, so that very much depends on um, the announcement today from the Prime Minister and the restrictions that remain in place but we would want to do that um, as soon as possible but I just want to reassure the committee that for our high risk offenders throughout the COVID period, we have continued to see them face to face. And with our lower risk offenders, even where we've been doing telephone contact, we have been increasing the amount of, of contact with people. Okay. All right. Um, uh, you mentioned Lord Chancellor, the Lamy Review. Mr. Slaughter, do you want to pick up any remaining issues around that? Mr. Slaughter? Hi, Joe. I, I didn't hear that. We we're talking about um, Lord Chancellor mentioned Lamy. Do you, I think yeah, you wanted to return to Chair, if, if I may, I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. There, there's a specific recommendation in the Lamy review on um, the commitment to capture protected characteristic data yes. for users, um, which the CTS, I think, committed to. What progress has been made on that? Is it still the intention to do that? Yes, I'm just checking the list here. Um, as I said, we've implemented uh, 16 uh, of the recommendations. We've completed them. Um, I'm just checking to see uh, the HMCTS recommendation. I've got one here, the Common Platform Additional Capability, capability for Cross-CJS Measurement of Ethnicity. That's the court data. Uh, I think we faced a bit of a challenge in actually just getting that done. I think it's been a bit of a logistical challenge. But I've already said to the committee that my aim is, frankly, to get all the uh, outstanding commitments that we've made. I think there were only two that we didn't accept, but the rest we did, within the next 12 months. I don't know whether Susan's got any more detail as to that particular, uh, particular recommendation. Yeah, so the specific recommendation on the common platform is obviously related to the rollout of the common platform, which isn't yet out there in courts, but we are building that capability in. We've also now built a collection of protected characteristics data into um, the mechanisms for our new digital services as part of reform across the court systems. So that's the, the common platform is the crime relevant part, but actually we're looking at it across the whole of the court system. <coughs> and we've got live with the first data collections on protected characteristics in our new services in the last couple of weeks, actually. When can we expect to see those then? Well, so they, they, they're happening now in the services we've introduced them to. In, for the common platform, we can't put that in until the common platform is rolled out, which will happen at, in, in, during the second half of this year. All right, thank you very much. That, 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 that's helpful, thank you very much. And, and finally, but... but, but uh, not unimportant at all. We talked about impacts of COVID in a number of areas. The profession itself, the legal profession itself, 
uh, has been significantly impacted. Um, Ms Barker, do you want to start on that then, Mr Daly? Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I'm just wondering, Lord Chancellor, has there been any conversations with the Treasury about extending financial support for the legal sector? Oh, yes, there have been many conversations and uh, they continue. I think the challenge has been to try and devise a scheme that is particularly bespoke for the legal profession and indeed there are differences between the solicitors and the barristers professions that fits into the overall uh, welcome approach that Treasury has taken to support millions of jobs and thousands of businesses and to some extent some of the uh, uh, Treasury measures have already had a beneficial effect so the furlough scheme has been useful in some measure uh, the bounce back scheme has been also used as have other uh, measures. I think what has been particularly difficult for uh, the legal professions has been cash flow uh, and particularly with regard to legal aid, I, I, I have instructed uh, my officials in the legal aid agency to do everything they can to help improve that cash flow in a revenue neutral way. In other words, money that would go to firms in the normal course of events because of the work they do, I think should continue to flow as much as possible, uh, whether it's uh, unpaid bills, whether it's uh, potential advance payments, whether it's hardship payments. And of course, we did take steps to radically change the hardship payment regime to lower the, um, the threshold amount before which you could apply from 5,000 right down to 450 pounds and to uh, allow claims to be made after only a month which uh, I think was a reduction from three months, and also to relax some of the evidence requirements as well. But I accept that more is sought, and uh, I'm working very hard, not just with the Treasury, but also internally, to see what more can be done in order to uh, help the flow of regular income to the professions, particularly those who are at the sharp end of legal aid. Uh, and uh, I think what attracts me is the idea of making sure that, for example, a solicitor's firm can have a regular monthly income uh, that uh, keeps uh, everybody and keeps, keeps the firm viable and keeps it afloat because we're going to need their capacity, uh, not just now, but in the future. And then similarly with the bar, see whether we can do more in order to reflect the particular cash flow problems that I know many practitioners are facing, particularly young practitioners and returning practitioners. So um, the uh, uh, conversations go on, the negotiations continue, but um, I uh, am going to continue to do whatever I can to uh, improve provision and to provide that necessary support. And as I say, I am being as imaginative and inventive as I can and as quickly as I can in order to come up with some more solutions to help both solicitors and the bar. I'm delighted to hear that, but as you know only too well, there's lots of newly qualified barristers who don't have accounts for 2018-19. Mm. So why won't the government support them, Lord Chancellor? Well, it's been a specific um, uh, request that I've made. I think as is so often the case, and quite understandably the case from a Treasury point of view, uh, if it's government money, it needs to be based upon evidence and there needs to be a clear audit trail about the award of any grant or any uh, financial support. I think the taxpayer would expect that, I think parliamentarians would expect that, and you can imagine that I or my officials would be hauled up in front of the Public Accounts Committee if we departed radically from that principle. But having said that, I understand it, I get the problem, I've been there myself, uh, I know uh, if I don't know the individuals personally, I'll know a lot of people uh, in that position from my own professional experience, and I want to do something to help. Uh, and that's why, um, whilst I know that time is pressing and people are uh, getting increasingly worried and anxious about the situation, uh, I, I will use uh, uh, all the imagination and power that I have in order to make... Uh, more provision to recognise the particular challenges being faced by the most vulnerable parts of the professions. So what's your view about providing monthly average incomes to those who can demonstrate a track record in providing routine legally aided yeah. services? Well, I, I'd alluded to that in the first answer, and that, I think, has a lot of attraction 
because this is income that they would have uh, earned anyway. Uh, I think we need to make sure that we uh, uh, make it as revenue neutral as possible. So, in other words, by providing a, a, a sort of consistency of income, that might mean later on, uh, you know, in the process, um, they might find they're, they're doing more work, but the, their income stays uh, fairly steady. Uh, but I think, frankly, remembering the challenges that I faced in terms of cash flow, I think what is important for practitioners is that regular stream of income so they can plan ahead and uh, you know, know that at the end of the month they will have enough to, to keep, keep going uh, because there is a, an existential question, a question of viability here. So it's that sort of approach that I am very attracted by and it's not just uh, you know, thoughts in my head. Uh, this is uh, uh, being very actively considered by my officials. Uh, it's something that I am pressing uh, all my team about and it's something that I would like to address as soon as possible in order to provide the sort of help that will really make a difference, I think, to many hard-pressed practitioners. Isn't the problem nobody in the Treasury, apart from maybe some ministers, has ever been self-employed, Lord Chancellor? They simply do not get <laughs> well, the issues. They have security of the public purse. Well, and they don't seem to give it the urgency it deserves. I, I could rail about the Treasury, uh, but I find that... I mean, I have to say the last spending round was, was, was a positive yeah. uh, piece of work in where, which the Treasury engaged with my department, understood the problems and acted. Uh, and therefore, I regard uh, the work that I do with the Treasury as constructive. I might not be able to get everything I want all the time, but I do have a high degree of success thus far. And whilst, again, I'm not going to sit here and breezily, confidently mm. say that I can get everything I want... We, we'll find a way. Okay. Uh, I am going to work hard to find a way to provide that extra support that I know is needed. Okay. Mr Daly. Lord Chancellor, I, I have to say something I've said to you before, but uh, in terms of criminal legal aid firms, I keep coming back to that, and I, I should make a de declaration of being 16 years working in that line of work. But in terms, I'm very, very pleased to hear about the, the potential for some form of monthly sustainable income one of, the suggestions, one of the suggestions in terms of criminal legal aid was that you take a period of time going back from the start of the lockdown of the court system, so say three, six months, you measure, you look at the average monthly payment criminal solicitors have received for that period of time, they would continue to receive that through this period because it is cash flow that is the issue. And I think both me and you know that there are ways of, re of recouping that money within, say, the next six to 12 months as well. I just wonder whether that... Um, I don't know whether I can tempt you, Lord Chancellor, whether that has any, um, any merits, do you think? Well, look, I think you put the case very strongly. Mm. Um, as I say, it would be, I think, wrong of me to just sort of make on-the-hoof commitments. I'm working as hard as I can to not just look at it from the avenue of that sort of support, but also through the Courts Recovery Programme to provide the case flow. Now, you know, my primary interest has to be the public interest, but... You know, there is a there is a benefit here from the profession for the professions in order to be able to work, uh, and therefore increasing capacity, increasing that case flow, will of course bring its own rewards to hardworking legal practitioners who help keep the system going day in day out. Have there been any discussions re with the Treasury regarding uh, business rate support for firms and solicitors, business rate, rate relief support? That's a, an issue that many firms talk to me about. Yeah. Yes, indeed, and it, it's one of the specific uh, points that I've made. The difficulty with that is that, of mm. course, the business rates um, uh, scheme was designed for a particular part of the economy uh, and particular types of outlets, so retail types of outlets, and uh, particularly the, um, the um, catering and restaurant and pub industry, which, of course, was a, going to be always acutely affected by an inability to trade from their premises. Uh, professional services are somewhat different. We have to acknowledge that. Whilst the premises is obviously a very important part of professional services in many respects, it, the, 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 the current restrictions don't necessarily prevent uh, people from working, as we have found. And I, th I think, therefore, looking at it from the Treasury's point of view, they will be anxious to, to draw quite a high threshold. Uh, and um, whilst I think it's absolutely right that we made the case and make the case, 
um, we also have to uh, be realistic about this, which is why um, rather than me relying on specific requests that might not be fulfilled, it's my job to be as imaginative as possible with the resources that might be available to me to come up with another solution. Just one very brief final question. Um, colleagues have spoken to me regarding the duty solicitor rota. And do you think there is any merit in um, taking away the requirement for an office in the area where, where you are on the duty solicitor rota? Because obviously the fixed cost of, a, of an office is a, is, a, is a burden for many criminal legal aid firms. And if they could still be on the duty rota, which is one of their main sources of mm. income, that would be something I think that would be welcomed by many, many, many firms. Oh, well, I think what I'd say about that, Mr. Eddie, is it's worth us talking further with the legal aid agency to see what... It's another example of the effects of COVID, and it does make us ask some fundamental questions. We've made assumptions based upon, shall we say, history and experience, and you know, we, we, we do things because that's how they've always been done. This crisis has meant that we've had to change the way we do things, and there are plenty of aspects of it that make me and others ask the question, well, just because we've always done them like that, is it the best way to do it? So I think that that sort of detailed conversation is something we need to take take up directly and we can uh, with my help you can engage directly with the uh, legal aid agency about aspects of the duty solicitor scheme and in its administration thank you thank you chair that's very helpful uh, lord charles because ultimately um, uh, as the courts come back on stream or whatever um, uh, unless we've got the infrastructure of of the profession to do the work in those courts on the criminal uh, on the legally aided work um, none of it comes to anything does it uh, well, that, 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 that's absolutely right. And, you know, being as long in the tooth as me in the profession, I saw the uh, problems uh, that were being wrought yep. upon criminal legal aid in the Absolute. noughties by the previous Labour government. Yes. And I saw a, a decline, progressive decline in young people coming into the criminal bar then. So this problem is, I'm afraid, but not you, of yes. recent Maybe. creation. Perhaps all the more reason, though, that we need to think that we, we, we look at a, a, a fresh look once as COVID passes, to how we approach and yes. support this. I agree with that, Sir Bob. Thank you very much. Well, Lord Charles, I'm very grateful to you, uh, to Ms Ackland Hood uh, and to Ms Farrah for your time and for your evidence. Uh, I do know that the staff in both the prison service and probation service and the court service are working immensely hard uh, under uh, stressful situations. I know the committee will want, uh, uh, through you, to, to thank all of them uh, for what they are doing. Um, but we appreciate your time. We're very grateful, as always, for your uh, time and courtesy, Lord Chancellor. Thank That's you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Your session is concluded. Order order. Proceeding has ended. The 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 proceeding has ended.